Sure. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Andrew Kang from UC San Diego, and with me is David Pan from UT Austin. We've uh, organized this seasonal school uh, for IEEE Circuits and Systems Society on AI and ML for IC design and EDA. Today is the second day and welcome. Um, we are recording this and there will be um, live transcription perhaps turned on if we um, do that like yesterday. Many of you were here yesterday, so you know how this works. Uh, there will be questions and answers that you can ask in chat and the chat will be saved and posted along with the video at the Telos YouTube channel. Um, so we have four days, two this week and two more two weeks from now. Without further ado, let's move on to the agenda for today. And I'll turn over the hosting to Karen Zhu, a postdoc at UT Austin. Okay, so today we will talk. We will have three talks. The first one is the from Professor Sachin Samika. Can go to the next slide. Yeah, our, the first title of the, the today's first talk is automating analog layout. Why this time is different, and the speaker is Professor Sachin Samika from University of Minnesota. Professor Sachin Samanika is the Heiner Chair in ECE and a distinguished McKnight University Professor at the University of Minnesota. He serves as PI of the Align project, which is a very famous analog layout system in the field. His current research interests include design automation methods for analog digital circuits, circuit reliability, and the algorithm and the architectures for machine learning. He's a recipient of the NSF Career Award, the SRC Technical Excellency Award, the Semiconductor Industrial Association's University Researchers Award, and he also has 12 Best Paper Awards. He has served as Chief Editor-in-Chief of the TCAD and the General Chair of the DAC. He is a Fellow of IEEE and a Fellow of ICM. Okay, Professor Pnika, here is your floor. Thank you for the introduction, Karen. Let me figure out how to share and then we should get started. Um, here we go. Okay, hopefully my screen is visible. Yes. Okay, so uh, I'm very happy to be here and to join this uh, summer school uh, or seasonal school. Um, and. Uh, the topic today is related to the automation of analog layout. The second part of the topic says why this time is different. And this is related to the fact that people have been trying to automate analog layout for decades now, and there have been some really good pieces of work. However, the translation of theory or papers into practice has been very limited. So I'm going to talk about why this is different. Also, since this is a school on AI ML, um, I'll be talking specifically about the uh, en enablements that are possible because of AI and ML. So let's start with some motivation. Uh, the basic reason why analog is becoming a lot more important is because there's a lot more analog around us. Traditional models of computing were basically feed something to a mainframe or a server and then get an output and it was mostly digital. But today computing is moving towards the real world. There's a lot more interaction with the real world through uh, say robotic assistants or through sensors that are embedded in systems. For example, in the wireless network or in smart cities where you might have data gathered from a large number of sensors and actions that are taken as a base on the basis of this data. Then there are other scenarios where you might have data centers with communication between racks through high-speed IO or even communication between chips. And that again is inherently analog. And a final example is autonomous vehicles where a vehicle has to sense the environment and perform some actions based on uh, the data that is sensed. Now, as all of this is growing, as the number of applications of analog uh, are growing, the number of analog designers in the world has not proportionately grown. 
this is tricky because analog design has traditionally been very, very designer intensive. And so the only solutions uh, to be able to keep up with this demand are A, to try and grow the number of analog designers, which isn't really happening at the rate that it needs to be done, or B, to try and automate the process. This is one of the strong motivators for recent advances in analog design automation. Interestingly, even things that look like they're all digital have significant analog components in them. This is a teardown of an iPhone 12. The 14 probably looks relatively similar. If I make an inventory of the, all the parts of this uh, phone, there are a few that are traditionally digital. And of course, some of these are kind of the main brains of the structure. But then you can see that there's a large amount of analog mixed signal uh, circuitry inside something like this. Even when you look at a much more traditional and older CPU, this is a 45 nanometer CPU that's over a decade old. If you look deep into the details, you'll see that there are a number of DLLs, PLL sensors, et cetera. So there is a lot more analog in both the digital, quote unquote, digital world, as well as in emerging applications. And this is increasing. Now, the problem with this, as I mentioned earlier, is analog design is often very manually intensive because uh, circuits are very sensitive to biasing conditions, uh, process variations, et cetera. And so the human designer has a large role to play. As a result of that, if you look at the design effort for a mixed signal chip, it's often an overwhelming part for the analog part, even though the silicon area is relatively small. If you look at the design risk, this design risk can be measured in terms of the likelihood that your chip is going to fail after you get your silicon back. Uh, that can be attributed quite significantly to the analog part. This is a relatively old picture. The picture here is from 2021, and it shows you the types of flaws that call, cause respins in chips. And uh, the first one, which is hard to read, is logic of functional flaws, clocking flaws. And the third one is tuning analog circuits. Now, you can see that this is number three over here. But if you see the trends, they're quite interesting. As you go from 2012 to 2016 to 2020, you can see that the uh, bar for analog is actually the fastest rising among all of these. This is not just because of new technologies, but also possibly because we are designing a lot more circuitry in analog than we used to do. So all of this contributes to the fact that analog design requires a lot more care when you're building your circuits and therefore automation can only help. Now, when you look at an analog design flow, uh, it's somewhat different uh, from a uh, digital flow uh, in the sense that uh, there's a lot of upfront manual uh, uh, design. So uh, you might design your circuit, your top choose your topology, size your transistors, et cetera. And that's typically done by a circuit designer. The back end is done by a layout designer. So this is basically tossed over the wall to the layout designer who doesn't necessarily know a lot about the circuit aspects, but is an expert in laying out polygons. Now, the reason why this has to be done by a human or has had to be done by a human is because the types of constraints in analog design are quite uh, different from digital design. There are requirements for symmetry. These symmetry requirements are often required because you need to have, uh, uh, you have differential circuits that must track each other through process variations. And if they don't, uh, then uh, you, your circuit behavior may not be as desired. By using symmetrical structures, you can actually uh, ensure that you get this kind of tracking. So the bottom line is that layout has a significant impact on performance, and it's being done by someone who's kind of not the circuit designer. So the traditional way in which the circuits are built are you have an optimizing uh, uh, step where the designer selects a topology. For example, if it's an ADC, they might choose a, a, a SAR ADC or a, a, a flash ADC or something of that sort. And once you choose the topology, then you actually figure out how you choose your parameters. So you size your transistors or choose your unit cap capacitors or design your passives, et cetera. Once you're done with that, then the circuit designer hands it off to the layout designer who 
typically performs ma manual layout. And this often is a very time intensive task and it can take uh, days, weeks, uh, et cetera. And once this comes back, then it goes back to the circuit designer. Now, remember that the circuit designer made these choices over here, transistor sizing, for example, but they had no idea of what the layout was. In other words, they had no idea what the parasitics were. In the absence of this knowledge, they had to guess on the parasitics. And of course, that guess may turn out to be quite wrong. And so you come back and you have a refinement step, and then you fed, send it back to uh, layout generation and so on and so forth. And this takes a pretty long time. Now, if we were able to speed this up, uh, if, for example, we were um, able to get automated layout here instead of the long layout step, then we could cut down the step significantly and this next step could start appearing much earlier. And given the time to market, we could actually perform a larger number of iterations in order to uh, optimize the circuit. And therefore changing this cycle time from weeks to hours can make an appreciable difference. It also allows the designer to explore a wide variety of topologies. So in our work, we've developed a, a system known as Align, which performs a layout synthesis for analog circuits. The input is a netlist and the output is a layout. Needless to say, this is not the uh, first uh, prob uh, solution to this problem. People have been knocking away at this for the last 35 years or so or longer. Um, and largely speaking, previous approaches have can be classified into various categories. The first category is the so-called procedure-based or rule-based uh, uh, approach. And these are often very circuit specific. They try to mind the mind of the designer to try and figure out how uh, you can um, generate layout for a specific circuit. And but they don't generalize across circuit types. The other type is to look at uh, optimization-based formulations. And these try to formulate the problem as uh, a mathematical optimization pro problem. Uh, again, uh, they try to capture stochastic uh, uh, effects because um, performing Monte Carlo simulations within the loop is really important to ensure that you are resilient to process variations. And there are a number of excellent uh, uh, pieces of work a number of prominent groups across the world that have contributed significantly to this. More recently, uh, there has been a, a flurry of activity in this area. Uh, I mentioned a line already. Uh, Magical from UT Austin is another significant effort in this area. Uh, USC has an effort known as AMC that's also uh, contributed quite a bit. And the nice thing about all of these is that their software is in the public domain. There are various other circuit sizing efforts. There's a recent work by a body of work by the Technical University of Munich that's done a really nice job of covering a, a wide variety of op amp topologies. So what is it that has changed? What is it that makes analog design more uh, automation more attractive? As I mentioned earlier, one reason is the demand for it, but Machine learning is really a big part of it. Machine learning now enables us to do things that were not previously possible. We are trying to essentially mind the mind of the analog designer or the analog layout engineer. And in order to do that, you cannot actually physically capture all possible uh, uh, scenarios using some kind of a procedural or rule-based approach. Uh, you cannot automate it using traditional methods, and that's become amply clear through the efforts over the last 35 years. But machine learning can actually help you. And in today's talk, I'll elaborate on some of this. The other thing that's helped in this is as we go to more advanced technologies, analog circuits have to follow digital circuits into uh, advanced technologies. Most analog designers would be very happy to design at 130 or 180 nanometers. But when you're designing something that's part of say a wireless transceiver where your baseband is all digital, your analog circuitry has to follow in, into that same node. Now in these uh, recent nodes, FinFET, uh, GA, FET and beyond, uh, there's a lot of design rule restrictions. For example, you have to have uniform pitch, you've got to have the same direction in a single layer, you have certain 
restrictions on the way you place your vias, et cetera. Some of these are challenging for the human designer who's accustomed to using their experience to find clever ways of getting around blocks and blockages and so on. But uh, for a tool, this is actually better because it reduces the search space. The other thing that has also helped, and we've used it particularly in Align, is to try and build something that works for a wide range of circuits. So this is an analog layout generator, not just for op amps or VCOs or LNAs, but for a wide range of circuits. And this is done by dividing circuits into categories. So you might have, for example, DC to DC converters or LDOs, which are power delivery circuits. These circuits really don't care too much about matching, but they do care about the impacts of parasitics. Uh, they are most efficient when they use inductors, et cetera. Similarly, if you look at circuits in high-speed links or RF circuits or low-frequency analog circuits, they have specific requirements and you can specify your constraints according to that. And by doing this judiciously, you can uh, uh, have a system that automates a wide range of circuits. So ML is certainly a large part of it, but there's a large uh, effect that comes out of non-ML aspects as well, which is the topic of a different talk, because today I'm going to focus mostly on the ML aspect. To give you a high level picture of how a line works, uh, this uh, slide shows you how we go from an input, which is a netlist without annotation, without any hierarchy, to an output, which is a GDS2 arrangement of rectangles. So the first step is to take this netlist, which is typically something like a spice netlist and recognize blocks within this. So for instance, you could go from here to recognizing the blocks. So you, this is a switch capacitor filter. You have a switch capacitor network here and you have an OTA, an operational transconductance amplifier sitting in the middle over here. Notice that if you see the way this is drawn, there are certain lines of symmetry that appear very naturally over here. And normally when a designer draws a schematic, those lines of symmetry will be implicitly provided or explicitly provided. Uh, our job is to try and find these because we may or may not have the schematic available. If the schematic is available, it may not be drawn well, et cetera. Once this is done, then we need to match this to the types of constraints uh, that this must meet. There are these constraints on symmetry, matching, shielding, et cetera, but there are also constraints on performance. So if it's a switch capacitor filter, you might have constraints on uh, the bandwidth, uh, the pass band, et cetera. Uh, then at this point, you have to kind of connect to the actual process. So the PDK for the process gives you the design rules as well as the electrical specifications. So all of this comes together and then the electrical specification might, for example, say that your wire length can, for this particular net can be no longer than so much and that's an input into layout. Once you have the, this hierarchical structure, then you can start building layout from the bottom up. So you might build it for the smallest blocks and go up and assemble it for the larger blocks. All of this is uh, going to be aided by ML models through the process. So let's go through an example of how this thing works. Let's go back to this switch capacitor filter uh, circuit again. So the first thing to do is to recognize the blocks within here. Notice, of course, that the switch capacitor filter was not in the form of a schematic, but in the form of a text file, which is the spice netlist. And then you recognize, for example, that a certain set of uh, transistors over here constitute your operational transconductance amplifier or OTA. So you recognize this. You also recognize lines of symmetry associated with this. Then you go down further into the hierarchy and you recognize differential pairs, current mirrors, loads, et cetera. So this process going from left to right has basically discovered the hierarchy in the circuit. And the goal of doing this was to uh, be able to find a way to drive layout because when you perform layout, you're going to go in the opposite direction. So you start from a design rule abstraction, you create layout for these smallest blocks, which are known as primitives. These things are then assembled into a layout for the next level block, which is the OTA. And then once you have the OTA, then you create a layout for this structure, which is as shown over here. The OTA sits over here and these larger structures are the capacitors. And you can see that there's a line of symmetry similar to the one that's shown over here. Okay, so this all looks perfectly simple and it 
possibly is if your goal was just to design an OTA or adjust a switch capacitor filter. But when you want to generalize this, you want this methodology to work across a wide range of circuits. And therein lies the challenge. Uh, one of the things that we realized as we were building this is that uh, designers tend to want a lot of control, especially analog designers. So there are some designers who are com perfectly comfortable with the entire flow from beginning to end, push a button, get the output. But then there are others who feel that they'd like more control, especially on circuits that uh, they know quite a bit about. And because we built this to be very modular, we provided multiple entry points. The first one was with no human in the loop. The second one was allowing the user to provide constraints or to override the constraints that were generated using a line. Uh, the third one is where the user not only provides these constraints, but also provides guidance on place and route. Uh, because in some cases, uh, when we worked with industry designers, they wanted some blocks to be placed in specific locations. And then there's a fourth class where uh, there are very large arrays that are built, for example, transistor arrays, where essentially the user can codify the placement and routing and uh, the task of the generator is to just build these large arrays. And this turns out to be very helpful when you're building powered uh, delivery circuits with very large transistors that are built as uh, large FinFET arrays. So I'll show you a few examples before going into the details of how exactly this is done. This, these are some examples from uh, Intel. They were built in 22 FFL, now known as Intel 16. Uh, and uh, there's an analog LDO and a digital LDO, there are uh, two different circuits. Some parts of this were built manually where a line was not exercised and in other parts, a line was exercised. And the interesting thing was in terms of the designer productivity, the manual design required something like 96 hours. The first entry point, the fully automatic solution gave you almost 100x improvement in uh, design time. Uh, when the designer specified the constraints, then uh, it halved, it was about 50x. And then when uh, the designer provided more in input, uh, it was something a little over 10x or so. Um, what does this have to do with the performance? Well, uh, as you would guess, the more designer input you get, the better performance it's possible uh, to have. So this is an example of a simpler circuit. This is a latch comparator over here. The spec here is a five millivolt input offset plus some other specs on uh, other parameters such as pre-charge delay power and area. The manual design does the best of all and this easily meets the offset criterion and all of the others. The other designs actually do kind of pretty well and they do increasingly better as you go from left to right that is with greater designer intervention. Uh, notice that even though here the offset is a little larger, it's well within the spec. And if you look at the area, this is the manual design. The uh, fully automated solution is slightly larger. And that's okay because analog circuits are typically so small that larger areas don't matter. The reason they might matter at all is because of parasitics. But those parasitics are already captured in the performance. If you allow the designer more input and still more input, then it becomes more compact. Uh, and Effectively, this one comes pretty close to uh, matching the specs of the, manual, of the human designer. This is a gallery of other circuits that Align has uh, created. These uh, are low frequency analog circuits. Uh, they are power delivery circuits. They are uh, uh, high speed link circuits. They are wireless circuits, etc. cetera. Uh, so this one in particular was a MIMO receiver that we just taped out in 65 nanometers. The area was something like 40% less than the manual design, and it uh, had comparable performance. Okay, so this is by way of explaining the big picture in terms of analog design and in terms of uh, talking about the um, problem statement. Where does machine learning or AI come into all of this? Okay. So um, if we look at various applications. Let's start with the first ap application, which was related to um, automated annotation. I think there's a question here about why uh, a line uh, v number three V1 had higher input offset. So if we go back to the previous slide, I can probably answer that. 
so in this case, uh, this was actually related to the fact that there was a specific wire that uh, 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 had a, a particular route that was non-symmetric. And uh, this was because it tried to uh, achieve a lower area. If we relax that constraint a little more, we were able to get uh, uh, a better offset. But either of these offsets are within the five millivolt spec. So uh, it wasn't necessarily a killer. Okay, so coming back to this, I'll show this as the first application of the use of AI and ML. So remember that our specification here is a bunch of lines of text. And from this, we have to extract the presence of specific circuit blocks. So let's say we are trying to find these OTAs over here. The interesting thing is that the number of possible topologies of OTAs number in the hundreds. This is just a small sample of those uh, topologies. So some of them are single stage OTAs, some of them are two stage OTAs, some of them use uh, a, a PMOS differential pairs, some of them use NMOS differential pairs, et cetera. So when a designer looks at something like this, they can pretty much immediately, instantly look at this and say, this is an OTA. The trouble is that it's not so easy for uh, a computer to do this, mostly because we've been using traditional approaches, which basically means that you need to uh, find, uh, uh, sort of enumerate all possible topologies, which is impossible because there are new topologies coming up and designers can make tweaks and change things. However, if you think about the way that a designer figures this out, they recognize that each of these has a differential pair structure over here where the input goes to uh, two differential inputs. Then there's a, a, a current source over here, which comes from a current mirror driven by a bias circuitry. And you can see again that this is available in a number of different circuits over here. And then there's a load and perhaps there's an output stage over here. So when you look at this, uh, you can certainly try to find these structures. And uh, if we create a graph for the network or the netlist that we have, we can try and see if the graph matches one of these uh, topologies. Again, the problem is that if we wanted to be exhaustive, we'd have to put in every possible topology in here, but uh, it's not possible or feasible to be exhaustive. And so another way to think about it is that a human designer could look at an unknown uh, topology and still say that it's an OTA. And the reason that they do that is because implicitly they're performing some kind of matching. And even if it's an approximate match, th that's perfectly fine. They can use that to uh, determine that it's an OTA. So this led us to the idea of trying to use approximate graph matching uh, using machine learning approaches. So if I go back to this thing, the idea here is that I want to identify some set of transistors as belonging to this OTA. And so if I look at the way that I perform a graph matching, I would use some kind of a graph a neural network to do this. A graph neural network is very similar to a CNN. In a CNN, you process an image and basically you pixelate the image. This is zooming into the eye and then every uh, pixel has an east, west, north, and south neighbor, except the ones at the edges. And then based on this, you run a filter and then uh, you uh, uh, perform convolution and go through multiple layers to handle this. The difference between a graph and an image is that in an image, the graph has a very regular grid structure, but in a ne network, it can be irregular. The degree can be uh, uh, different for different nodes, etc., And there is no unique embedding. However, you can use the same ideas of convolution, except that your operator now has to be a graph convolution operator. So there are various types of graph neural networks that are available out there. These are, some of them are listed over here. Uh, if you write out the expressions for these, they become a certain amount, they introduce a certain amount of complication. But fundamentally, if you try and see what's going on over here in each of these, you're going from the, L layer, N minus one layer to the L layer. And each of these, you are getting the updated feature vectors for the L layer based on the feature vectors in the L minus one layer. That's true here and here, as well as here and here. There are two basic operations. The first operation is a weighting operation. You take your previous uh, feature vector and multiply it by a weight matrix. 
and then you aggregate. So basically what happens here, is, let's take graph sage, for example, I perform the weighting operation in every vertex, and then I perform an aggregation in some neighborhood of this uh, uh, vertex. And essentially that means that I need to use the adjacency matrix to communicate with the neighbors and accumulate the information. If I think of this as the convolution operation, then I can think about this pretty much the same way as CNN. I can go through multiple layers of this, and then I can train the network to try and uh, recognize specific objects. So let's start with this thing. Initially, this was a netlist. Uh, I've drawn the schematic, but it's really a netlist. But the netlist can be translated into a graph of some sort. So for example, every transistor is a vertex, every net is a vertex, and I have connections between these depending which are labeled based on the source train and gate connections. I can feed this graph into a trained uh, uh, graph convolutional network. And then based on this, I can uh, uh, highlight the vertices that belong to specific uh, uh, classes. So I can say, for example, that this vertex is in the OTA class. I can say that this is none of the above. Or if I had a mixer or an LNA, then I could highlight, classify those vertices as belonging to uh, those classes. And then I can collect these and use that to create my hierarchy. So the first approach that we used for this was based on using a graph convolutional network using uh, th this work over here. Um, and based on this, it was pretty successful for this structure. Uh, we were able to classify most of the nodes correctly. This is the confusion matrix. You can see that the OTA nodes were mostly uh, classified correctly. One of the bias nodes was misclassified, but most of the misclassifications were actually fairly obvious kinds of things. So for example, you'd have a transistor where the source and gate were part of uh, a block, but the drain was not. And so since the transistor must lie within the, uh, um, uh, uh, the same block, the entire transistor, a simple post-processing operation fixes that and you can get uh, perfect matching. Uh, once you have this kind of matching, then th the next step is that you take the smaller cir uh, circuit and then you try to identify the sub blocks of this, which can, is actually easy to do because these do not have a lot of variation. There's, the way that you build a differential pair, for example, is two transistors in parallel. So you can have a larger size, a smaller size, et cetera, but it's fundamentally still two transistors. So you can do this using traditional algorithmic techniques uh, using graph traversals. Once you have this, you can also recognize that an OTA will have a line of symmetry. You can uh, discover this line of symmetry, and then you can use this to build the layout for the structure. Okay, so uh, um, this is another example. This is a phase array receiver. I've shown the schematic to be compact, but the actual content looks something like this. And then if you pass this through the process, then again, the confusion matrix looks very good after post-processing. We've also recently tried a number of different types of uh, 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 graph neural networks for this. The initial approach used the uh, GCN approach, and this was the Ghana method that was shown here. Uh, and after going through a lot of these, we found that the graph sage plus method, which works on multigraphs, uh, labeled multigraphs, actually is the best performing one of these. And then we run this through a number of uh, uh, circuits. The inference time is on the order of milliseconds, so it's extremely fast. And it gives you pretty good accuracy. The F1 scores over here uh, are uh, pretty uh, decent. Now, one of the things, uh, problems with this kind of approach is that uh, you have to curate a training set. Now you can do this for an OTA, you can do this for a VCO, you can do this for an LNA, but at some point the cost of curating this training set becomes prohibitive. So we looked at another approach that can be applied without a training set. And this is a bottom-up approach where, uh, for example, if I have a circuit that looks like this, I can recognize that there are these blocks over here and these blocks are actually repeated blocks. This happens a lot in analog design. There are single blocks that are repeated multiple times. This can happen, for example, when you have uh, a, a current mirror structures, there are repetitions over there, but even at higher levels of abstractions, in an FIR equalizer, you can see that these are uh, very similar to each other. 
sometimes the similarity is just that it's a similarity but not a congruence so for instance there for an fir equalizer that we were looking at some of these current sources use seven bits some of them use five bits and that depends on whether it's working on the the main cursor or a precursor or a post cursor and which precursor and post cursor it's working on so uh, we i'll show you another example that illustrates this thing uh, there are times when you might want to uh, perform approximate matching even here so this is a picture of uh, an, a differential nla lna configuration this uses a common gate structure this uses a common source structure when you lay these out, this is a manual layout. It actually is laid out very, very symmetrically. These two are symmetric with each other. But if I look at these circuits individually, they are different from each other. The reason we do this is because they are approximately identical. And the way that we recognize this is as we go from here to here, we try to find out the so-called graph edit distance. In other words, if I represent this by a graph, how many edits do I need to make to get to the graph for this one? So first, for example, I could delete these edges and come up with this. Then I could add these edges over here and I'm over here. And in four edits, I've gone from here to here. So if the number of edits is small, then the two circuits are close to each other and they deserve to be symmetric. If it's large, then they have a, a significant difference. Uh, so we use this idea where we try to uh, kind of perform a combination of traditional graph-based traversal-based matching. So for something like this, uh, it works pretty well. You can actually have a traditional uh, graph-based matching and that can capture the symmetries in this structure. Uh, sometimes, in fact, even for this structure, there are times when a designer may place dummy transistors over here for post-silicon correction. And you might have a different number of dummy transistors here as opposed to uh, here. And in that case, you would also need uh, approximate matching. But in other cases such as this, the need for approximate matching is very clear. Uh, the way that we perform this approximate matching is that uh, there is again uh, uh, some work on trying to discover graph similarity scores. And so you can input two graphs over here, you can encode the feature vectors, and then uh, based on this network, you can output a, a similarity score. And uh, that is used to determine whether the graphs are similar enough to be asymmetric or not. So using this, we were able to find regularity in structures. This is an R2R DAC, and you can see that this R2R structure with the switches is repeated uh, uh, several times, and that is discovered uh, as shown here. This is the FIR equalizer I'd shown you earlier, where I needed approximate matching because some current sources were five bits, some were seven bits. And then by doing that, this got recognized and translated into layout. The seven bit switches are larger and they're over here. The five bit switches are smaller and they're on the periphery. Okay. The next part of this that I'll talk about is, I'll skip through a few steps. I'll talk about the place and route uh, uh, a region where we can also significantly make use of AI and ML. Now, one of the big problems we've seen that we can go from schematic to layout and generating a layout is not a problem. Generating a layout that meets specs is a difficult problem because there you have to worry about the uh, lengths of your uh, wires, the parasitics, the fact that they need to match, etc. cetera. Um, there is often a drop in performance between schematic and layout. Uh, so this is one particular circuit where the schematic, which didn't have a good estimate of parasitics, assumed a certain gain bandwidth and unity gain frequency, but after layout, because you couldn't match those assumptions, the performance dropped off quite significantly. So the goal, of course, is to try and minimize this gap as much as possible. So what we can do over here is use a graph neural network structure to determine whether the performance is going to be good enough or uh, not. And again, that can be used to either predict the performance or to give you a yes, no answer based on the performance values. The first approach uh, to this is to try and see whether you can discover the constraint boundary. So you have a set of constraints that are provided for an OTA, for instance. And the, you have a specification in this. And for example, if your gain has to be greater than 42, can you find 
the location of the boundary where the gain reaches 42. So if you have a circuit topology that looks like this, and if you say that the uh, performance depends on the parasitics, then you can first start with discovering upper bounds on the lengths of these wires, and that gives you a constraint region that you can work with. Once you have this upper bound, the actual constraint region is not going to be this because maybe I can lengthen one wire and make another wire shorter. So it's going to be some kind of a, a, a linear or nonlinear relationship between these. So what we tried to do was we used a variety of uh, ML approaches, uh, uh, a multi-layer perceptron, logistic regression, support vector machines, et cetera. And then what we saw was that when we applied these to try and predict the performance, it turned out that for some circuits, the blue bar, which represents the linear SEM, works pretty well. This actually happens for constraints that are well represented by linear approximations. But for other constraints, if I try to look at the linear SEM model, it really did not perform very well at all. And in this case, we had to go to a multi-level perceptron in order to get decent performance. So inherently, this is because the underlying constraint could be linearly separable or not. And uh, so based on this idea, we came up with an approach for um, discovering these constraint boundaries. Uh, it's easier to see this in this picture. So let's say you have a, a search region over here, you perform some stratified sampling in this case. And then based on the stratified sampling, you try to take your performance parameter P1 and you try to fit a linear SVM to it. And in this case, you get a pretty decent fit. But if you try to do that over here, it would be a terrible fit. So you start with a stratified sampling to extract the linear constraints, see how good uh, uh, the error is. If it's good, you stop there. Or you try denser sampling, and then you see if you need uh, uh, an, uh, an MLP or whether an SVM with uh, denser sampling is good enough or not. And this actually works pretty well in terms of detecting the constraint boundary. Of course, if you change your constraints, you need to perform your sampling all over again. So in this case, you can see that uh, for the five transistor OTA, for all of these parameters that were shown over here, uh, precision recall and F1 scores are shown over here. And in many cases, you can use a linear SVM, but in this case, a multi-level perceptron was required. For other types of uh, OTAs, for the two-stage OTA in particular, there were more nonlinear constraints, so you needed a multi-level perceptron in more cases. This again gets translated into layouts, and since that was the uh, eventual objective, uh, this constraint boundary generation is translated into specific layout topologies. Uh, the other approach to do the, doing this is to try and be independent of, uh, or more independent of the constraint boundary. And in this case, we used a GNN-based approach. So we took the circuit, abstracted it into a circuit graph, and then we went through multiple layers uh, until we were able to predict whether the performance met specs or not. Now, the interesting thing about this is that as you take your graph and as you coarsen it through multiple layers, uh, what happens is that there is a natural ability to handle a wider range of circuits over here. So if I have multiple variations of an OTA, for example, I'd shown earlier that you can have a large number of OTA topologies, the initial graph may look very different, but eventually when you kind of collapse this graph, there will be a node that, or a set of nodes that corresponds to the differential pair, a node or a set of nodes that corresponds to uh, the current uh, mirror or biasing circuitry, et cetera. So in fact, this approach is actually generalizable across a larger number of topologies, and you can use it uh, to use performance prediction across a number of topologies. So this is the P approach, and uh, this was found to have a uh, pretty good performance across a range of topologies. Okay, um, I'll skip through some of this because I also want to uh, kind of leave enough time for Q&A. Um, a brief word on routing as well. Uh, routing in this case uh, is performed using A star search, but there are significantly different constraints as compared to digital routing because you have to honor symmetry, matching, maximum length, shielding, et cetera. And in fact, when you're performing matched routing, you actually have to match not only the length, but you have to match the length in each layer. 
and the sequence of layers, because uh, that determines the parasitics, it determines the R C time constants, et cetera. Uh, one of the things that happens in fin-fed designs, especially in lower metal layers, is that you're required to work in multiples of a wire pitch. So if there are times when the wire resistance is too large and it can perf cause performance degradation. So in those cases, you need to use multiple parallel wires in order to uh, achieve effectively a uh, wider wire size. Uh, so again, we've used an ML-based approach, which modified the P network, the graph neural network that I talked about earlier to create a so-called wire GCN. And uh, this was used to perform um, wire sizing and routing for uh, a larger circuit. This is a scenario where you can see that the wire sizing is implemented in this way, three wires over here, two wires over here. And this was discovered by the GNN. Now, finally, there's also uh, uh, this issue of what happens after layout generation, what happens beyond layout generation, uh, because layout generation is part of the picture. When you think about the overall picture, it's the designer creating the schema, uh, going from the schematic, optimizing the circuit, and then going on to layout, and there are iterations involved in this. So how can you kind of capture this? This is some work that we did in collaboration with a group at USC. Uh, they came up with this initial step, which was schematic optimization. So they had a, an approach for neural network based surrogate modeling. And basically what they did was they used Bayesian optimization uh, to guide uh, some sampling approaches. And then they used a multi-level perceptron to uh, uh, create a model for, a specific, uh, for specific blocks. However, this model is layout unaware. So they hooked it up with uh, a line uh, generated layouts and they use that to learn something about the, uh, uh, the parasitic uh, values over here. So they took this model and they refined it using a line generated layouts and came up with a, a better model. Using this model, they had an approach for performing circuit sizing so this circuit sizing gave, uh, gave them the appropriate set of sizes for the schematic that's shown over here. Now, especially in analog designs, the process variations play a big role and what you get after manufacturing may be very different. So they added an additional uh, step. They actually took these chips, sent them to fab and then measured them and used uh, this feedback loop to correct the model. And when they did this, they found that for this VCO circuit, for example, uh, the layout based the uh, uh, layout based neural network model, which came out of this step, was somewhere over here. Uh, depending on the V control value that was used for the VCO, this was the amount of power that it used. This is one parameter. Uh, if the post layout simulation gave them something like this, but the uh, silicon results were somewhere here when they use this to kind of close the loop, they were actually able to bring this yellow line down to match the blue line almost exactly. And so for the next respin, uh, the hope is that you can do significantly better. Okay. So uh, what I've tried to do in this talk is to try and provide some sense of why analog uh, design automation is difficult, why, uh, what the overall context is and where AI and machine learning can um, try to uh, play a role over here. Previously, analog design automation was considered impossible. I, there were plenty of academic papers, but really very little industry adoption. Uh, this is changing now for many reasons. One reason is the larger demand. The other reason is the fact that we can actually have solutions that can work across multiple families uh, of uh, circuits. Unlike digital circuits, where every circuit basically has a single metric, power, performance, area, well, three metrics, uh, for analog circuits, depending on which circuit you have, your metric changes. And if your metric changes, then the way that you measure it changes, your benchmarks change, your test benches change, et cetera. And so there's a much wider diversity, and this is part of what makes the uh, task difficult. Machine learning is a very significant part of the solution. I've tried to show in this talk how machine learning can 
essentially replace the so-called designer intuition that leads to good design. So for instance, the recognition uh, problem is really a big part of it because if you're trying to perform layout automation, how do you recognize specific blocks? And once you recognize these and build the hierarchies, you can use those to construct the overall solution uh, in a hierarchical way. Uh, by doing this in an automated manner, we can actually seed layout automation techniques. The other place where uh, ML can be extremely helpful is in performance estimation. And this is still a very challenging problem, but the issue here is that performance really depends on things like transistor sizes or topology selection or wire parasitics, et cetera. And if you can build ML-based models or ML-based uh, approaches that capture this, then that can go a long way towards helping you to build designs that meet specifications and build layout and optimization loops that are fully automated as compared to uh, uh, being iterative processes between a human designer and a human layout engineer. So uh, this concludes the talk. I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Thanks, Professor Sapnika. So a very fascinating talk. So we have do have a couple of quick, a few questions in the chat. You can also look into them. Uh, the first question we have is from the Dev J Pao is why a line Number three, V1 has higher input offset. Uh, yeah, I, I think I answered that earlier. This was basically related to us, uh, the fact that the V1 was actually within the specification, so it ended up choosing uh, a, a wire connection that was not perfectly symmetric. And then uh, it turned out that it was actually quite easy to change that at the cost of uh, very minimal area overhead. Great. Uh, second question we have uh, is from Xi Bing. He is asking, are the results presented at the most, uh, the most the latest result are, you, are in use in the latest technology? So uh, it depends on what you mean by latest technology. We worked across a range of uh, nodes. It ranges from 12 nanometers to uh, uh, we, we have some bulk results in 65 nanometers, 130 nanometers, uh, etc. So we have a range of uh, FinFET and bulk technologies. The, the most recent technology we have is 12 nanometers. Thanks, Professor. So we also have another question from the DPG. So he is asking, uh, see how they have made in the node and the edge. Um, is that a really question? No, maybe I'm not. not sure I understand the question. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, you, like you can clarify that, a bit, otherwise we can move on to the next one. Sure. So we have a question saying like, uh, how does uh, the AI ML approaches compare with the other traditional method uh, of pre procedure optimization or stochastic algorithms? Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, I think, again, uh, we have to go to specific approaches. If you look at something like recognition, the, there's a comparable prior approach from Helmut Grabe's uh, group on recognition. Um, they were not able to uh, look at any sort of uh, fuzziness in the data. So, for example, if you change your topology, they were not necessarily able to uh, recognize uh, structures based on that. Uh, because of the, the the way the thing was structured was that it was very procedural and deterministic. In fact, we've tailored that approach and we've used parts of that approach for our lower level recognition. So we go through a first level of recognition where we identify the big blocks. And then within the big blocks, we identify things like differential pairs, et cetera. And we've leveraged their approach in that second part because it's actually very well done for that part. Uh, but for the first part, uh, I think AI ML makes a big difference because uh, it is able to deal with uncertainty and uh, approximate matching in a way that uh, conventional algorithms are not able to do. Similarly, for constraint generation, if you look at the P approach that I talked about, where there was the uh, uh, graph neural network that gets progressively coarsened as you go from layer to layer, uh, this is something that prior approaches were not able to capture very well. So this is a new capability that is facilitated by AI ML. 
Great, thanks, Professor. So we do have a, a, a couple of other questions too. So the next question is, Align does well in identifying topology. So is Align planning any sort of topology exploration or and the synthesis in the given set of constraints? Yeah, so, uh, uh, so far Align has primarily focused on layout generation. We have not looked at uh, topology exploration and synthesis at this uh, point. But this is certainly an area that we uh, are interested in looking at in the future. Thanks. So we have the last question in the chat. Uh, in the analog design, we frequently face with the regular macro actions, like the ones uh, defined in, for example, in the action with scale CAD. What about similar features to sp speed up the machine learning for analog layouts? So I think what you're talking about here are predefined cells of some sort. So these, for example, could be P cells that are uh, specified use in a cadence environment or macro blocks. This happens even when you have something like an inductor. Uh, typically designers don't design their own inductors. They come as part of the PDK. Uh, so you get an ind inductor kit part that you just plop into your design. Uh, Align is able to black box th these. And uh, because Align works in a kind of a gridded fashion, all that it needs to do is to get terminals for these, box, uh, these boxes that lie on a grid. And uh, once th th there's this grid alignment, uh, it can just treat it as a black box and lay it out. Great, thanks, Professor. I think these are all the questions we have in the chat. So if it's possible, maybe you can state a little bit and if everyone has other follow-up questions for Professor Nika, maybe you can ask in the chat. Thank you again. Let's uh, thank the speaker once more. Yeah, thanks. That's great. Sorry. I talked. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, I think we are quite on time for the second speaker. So I see Professor Pulin has arrived. Maybe we'll wait for a minute and uh, the start of the introduction. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can hear we can you. Hear awesome. You. Okay. Okay. So, Karen, you can start. Okay, yes. sure. So, it's my honor to introduce our second uh, speaker today, Professor Sun Kulin from Georgia Tech and the DARPA. So, the presentation he is going to do today is titled with machine learning powered tools and methodologies for 3D integrations. Professor Sun Kyu Lin received a PhD degree from UCLA in 20, 2000, and he joined the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology in 2001, where he is current the Motorola Solutions Foundation professor. His research focuses on the architecture design and the electronic design automation for 2.5D and 3D assays. He has published more than 400 papers on the topic, and he received multiple best paper awards, including Atropy Transaction on Electromagnetic Capability and the TCAD recently. He began serve, serving as a program manager for DAPA Microsystem Technology Office since 2022. Okay, Professor Sun Kyu Ling, now you have the floor. All right, so let me go ahead and share my screen first. Let's see, share and full screen. Do you see my screen now? Yes. Awesome. And do you also see my mouse moving? Yes, I will say awesome. mouse. Okay, let's get started. Again, it's my great, great pleasure to be here. Um, um, it's been a while since I... Uh, uh, Auto class, <laughs> so it's, it's it's a very interesting experience for me. Um, again, my topic today is going to be utilizing machine learning algorithms for 3D IC uh, design and also EDA. I have three parts. The first is a little bit about uh, the motivation, why machine learning. I'm pretty sure that previous uh, presenters already covered uh, most of it. So I'll spend a little bit about time on 3D ICs because I assume that not all of you in this classroom, by the way, we have more than 100 people. I, I, was, I was surprised. Um, 
uh, know about 3D IC. So I'll briefly introduce that. And then I'm gonna jump into two topics. Uh, I try to do a survey right on these topics, but uh, there aren't that many out there. So I just you know chose to uh, focus on uh, the work from my students, not mine, but my students' work. Two of them I chose and uh, we'll dive into them. The first is on using machine learning algorithms to do tier partitioning in 3D IC. And the second is using, again, machine learning algorithms to do clock tree synthesis. <clears throat> so I'll try and you know stop in the middle right after tier partitioning and see if there's any question. Then I'll do the same after I cover the second work. So again, I uh, am guessing that most of you are familiar with physical design if you're not. Physical design is transforming a med list that was just synthesized from RTL to GDS layouts so that you know they are uh, manufacturable. You can tape out the design to uh, foundries. There's a lot of uh, important problems that need to be solved during physical design itself. Uh, it's well-defined steps uh, that people go through to do the transformation from that list to GDS2, starting with uh, mm -hmm. flow planning and power ground uh, 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 network planning. And then uh, you go in uh, and find out XY locations for all the gates, which is placement, then followed by um, um, pre-CTS optimization for time enclosure. After that, you add clock tree and then post the CTS optimization again for time enclosure. And then you move on to detail and uh, global and detailed routing. And again, yet another round of timing optimization. After you're done with all of that, you do a simulation to um, collect uh, the metrics related to power and timing and area and also reliability. Um, many of these problems are very tough problems. Uh, we have a nice uh, phrase to describe that, which is NP part or complete. Uh, again, the solution space there is exponential for even very small size problems. So finding out best solution is impossible, uh, impractical. So we rely on heuristic algorithms. The reason why I'm talking about all this is because most of you are very familiar with uh, all this is because heuristics are the ones that are designed by human. And today I'm going to talk about how human design heuristic uh, compares with machine learning algorithms. So with that, um, I get this question, you know, often machine learning, right? Uh, uh, Velocity design, digital design, how can machine learning help um, design, right? In general, I see two main uh, areas that uh, machine learning can help. The first is the fact that machine learning can help designers better use of the tools. So it makes the users smarter. And I have a good example of doing that uh, where uh, I use machine learning algorithms to tune, tune two parameters. If you wanna use a, a physical design tool, uh, you have to set some parameters before you push the button. If you have a lot of experience, uh, you know how to tune these parameters, even for new circuits with new technology node. Uh, if you don't, then you try and error. You know, it takes a lot of iterations, spend a lot of time. Uh, machine learning can help you tune those two parameters. So that's what I meant by uh, machine learning can help users uh, make better use of the tools. Then there's a second part of it, which directly impacts the quality of the EDA tools themselves, especially physical design tools. So various steps in the physical design that I talked about, the floor planning, placement, routing, time closure, clock structure synthesis, those algorithms, again, are heuristic algorithms that are designed by human. And machine learning can also help improve the quality of those tools by doing things in slightly in different ways. Again, relying on supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning. So today, how today I have um, examples of uh, these two uh, main areas. So let's spend a little amount of time on three D IC. 
So depending on who you talk to, what is 3D IC? Many different <laughs> definitions of 3D IC is out there. Um, you know, if you talk to a person from packaging, right? Uh, 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 Interposer itself, some 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 people in that community calls Interposer based uh, uh, system 3D IC, right? Uh, if you talk to uh, folks from uh, um, circuit designers, right? They have different definitions of 3D IC. So 3D IC today that I'm going to focus on is specifically uh, a bare die stacked digital 3D IC. Yes, there's heterogeneous integration and a mixed signal analog RF. Uh, my focus today is a bare die stacked, which means no interposer, just a bare die stacked and bonded. And then um, uh, digital, right? So uh, how do you form 3D ICs? How do you make 3D ICs? Uh, the fundamental enabling technology is quite, in fact, straightforward. You need a way to bond the dice. You need a way to drill holes through the dice so that you can connect these dies. So it's bonding and drilling, basically, you know, in a very simple way to describe 3D ICs. Now, currently there are um, several leading technological options for doing bonding and drilling, you know. So uh, I'm sure most of you heard about this terminology called through silicon via. So that's in fact how you drill up, uh, you know, holes in your die so that you can establish connections between non-adjacent dies that are in a stack. So you would use Bosch process or laser annealing uh, through silicon via. Basically, it goes through the silicon, right? And then you fill it up with uh, silicon uh, uh, liner, dioxide liner, and then also fill it up with copper. So TSVs uh, are, are in fact commercialized in memory applications, memory products. Um, you know, uh, HBM is a good example of that. Um, and of course, uh, in so that's how you drill a hole in a die. You have if then you have to bond the dies together. Uh, people use two main approaches to bond the dyes. The first is using small balls to bond dyes. So those balls are called micro bumps. It's a bump, right? And size is micron, so it's micro bump. So on the left bottom, you see how Samsung, you know, uh, bonded, stacked and bonded, right? And then connected the DRAM dyes right, on top of each other using TSV and micro bump. Uh, and then the middle is uh, Intel's uh, version of microbomb technology, where in this case, you see th four things that are stacked over here. On the very bottom is the package of the whole 3D IC, but the middle two, the middle two are the two digital dies that are bonded, bare dies. So the top is a 10 nanometer die that has all the timing critical components. And then the bottom die is 22 nanometer die that has non-timing critical components. And then these bare dies are bonded face to face or metal to metal, right? And then they use small bolts to stick these dies together. And then of course, there's gonna be empty space in the middle uh, in between. So you use some kind of material to fill up that uh, void. Then of course, on the very top is uh, DRAM, but this DRAM on the very top is package on package. You first package DRAM, then you stack package DRAM to whatever it is in, it, that's below. The reason for this POP stacking is because DRAM is so sensitive to heat, but in the, the middle two dies are generating a lot of heat because they're logic dies. In order to you know, you know, kind of block the heat um, flow, they package it first and then, then stack. Now on the bottom right, we see uh, a very different way of bonding to uh, the dies, which is called hybrid bonding. I don't have the zoom in shot that shows the, the actual bonding mechanism there, but what happens here is uh, hybrid, bond, hybrid bonding does not use any balls to bond the dies together. You just uh, bond uh, on copper pads directly with each other. The reason why they call it hybrid is because the conductors, the copper pads are uh, bonded together, but then in the silicon dioxide in between and the insulator also are bonded together. So it's hybrid form of bonding. Why do we do this, right? Bonding and drilling and you know, 
gluing and the benefit and turned out this simple technology enables a lot of cool things. The first, it, it, it continues Moore's law, which is a big deal to everyone in the semiconductor industry. So, so far, you know, we have been trying very hard to make transistors small to add more transistors onto the same footprint. That's becoming incredibly hard these days. So there aren't that many foundries left in, in the game. But stacking, if you need more transistors, well, you don't need to make the transistors small anymore. Just stack them, you know, linear increase. Uh, improve cost and yield. This was, huh? 3D IC improving cost and yield. I mean, don't you need new equipment? You know, uh, new equipment. Uh, you need dollar to pay for the equipment. Uh, the yield is going to be low because you have you need additional process to bond and you know align. And what do you mean improving cost and yield? Intel made a very good point about how 3D IC can help improve cost and yield. Again, using uh, what's shown on the bottom center, their Lakefield processor, which is commercialized. You can buy this processor today in the market. If you buy a Lenovo foldable laptop, the processor there in that laptop is this Lakefield processor. They originally planned to uh, uh, manufacture their uh, processor using 10 nanometer technology. Turned out they had some trouble, you know, uh, with the yield. So what they decided eventually, right, is to not do everything in 10, but do some in 22 and then some in 10. And that's that, right? So that heterogeneous 3D IC is easier and cheaper to manufacture than 10 nanometer 2D. So there's cost and yield saving there. Uh, better PPA. Uh, people started reporting this 3D IC comparable to 2D, smaller, wide lengths, shorter. Latency improves. Our consumption reduces because of small gates and fewer buffers and, you know, smaller wire cap. Uh, heterogeneous integration. Now, you don't need to worry about, you know, um, having... Uh, uh, a single die SOC that has all these mixed signal components. Analog doesn't need to be, you know, uh, three nano. Right? I mean, you can do it with uh, uh, a little bit older technology. Uh, SRAM versus logic, they may have different, you know, uh, better optimized technology, you know, manufacturing process to manufacture them. Well, let's go ahead and implement these different components with their own optimized process and build multiple dies, then stack them. Instead of having to worry about, you know, making everything in, 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 the, in the same house, right? Of course, these are the benefits, but then nothing comes for free. Challenges, manufacturing. Uh, again, we need additional process to bond and drill and media tools uh, lagging behind. Uh, I get this question about thermal and power delivery. Every time I present a 3D ICs uh, test, you know, you don't want to, bond a bad die and a good die you waste both how do you test before bonding and after bonding so let's jump into the main topic today the first one is machine learning powered 3d ic tier partitioning so tier partitioning is a pretty big you know deal here in 3d ic design so what you what, what you do in here you decide who goes to the top who goes to the bottom Right? It's a very simple design, you know, decision in a way, but then that has tremendous impact on the final, you know, design quality. Tier partitioning. Well, isn't that easy? You know, I mean, if I want to do memory on logic, you put all the memory in one tier and then everything else, all the logic on the bottom. Yes. If you want to do a very simple uh, partitioning as memory on logic, it could be done manually, you know? Uh, compared to that, if you want to do a little more sophisticated, you know, uh, to your partitioning, uh, logical logic, you got to decide for each logic component whether you're better off in, in the top tier versus bottom tier. Why? Because in a 3D IC, on the top you have heatsink, and on the bottom you have C4 bumps that deliver current into the chip. So the bottom tier is better for power delivery, 
but worse for cooling because you're farther away from heat sink. Vice versa, right? So depending on where you go in between the two tiers, you know, you're talking about a thermal versus power delivery trade-off. Then on top of that, you know, depending on where, where you're in the same tier or different tier, the delay could be different. Right. So uh, this tier partitioning decision has tremendous impact on PPA and reliability. So how can machine learning help? Um, 3D ICEDA in general, you know, uh, there's no commercial tool available yet, although uh, these EDA vendors are working on it. And there's some, there's some academic efforts as well. Uh, to me, right, um, 3D IC. Uh, physical design tool, right, can be built in two, dif two different uh, uh, ways. The first is so-called true 3D, and then second is pseudo 3D. What do you mean true 3D? You start with another list. You you know partition these gates to different tiers and then place them. Basically, finding find you find out X Y Z, right, uh, and then you do true 3D placement. And then once you're done with placement, and then you would just you know route uh, these gates using again double the metal stack, right? So that is in fact the right way uh, to do this, right? But then uh, uh, this commercial tool is not ready. Uh, uh, it needs to be set hard to be done. There's a lot of things that you need to worry about during that process of doing 3D placement, 3D routing, and 3D time enclosure. And instead, instead, I, I tried that by the way, you know, building true 3D. A flow myself, uh, it was hard. Hard in a sense that it was not easy for me to beat commercial 2D design quality. <laughs> commercial 2D was so good, you know, any academic effort, try and beat that commercial 2D with academic 3D, true 3D, right? It was almost impossible because we only have what? Small group of people versus thousands of engineers at Cadence and Synopsis. That means if we give enough investment to these uh, EDA companies, they may be able to, you know, pull it. But that's not starting yet because they don't have the orders from design the houses yet. In any case, pseudo 3D, right? So this is an immediate, you know, approach until uh, commercial vendors produce true 3D. What do you mean pseudo 3D? Um, you build the 2D, right? Using a commercial tool, which is readily available today. Then you transform that, transform uh, that to 3D IC design. In a media 2D, uh, you will need to first partition it. And then you will need to kind of do a little adjustment because the footprint is different, right? And then you have to do uh, routing again, right? And then you have to do time enclosure. Now, if you have to do partitioning and you know routing and why why intermediate two D at all to begin with, right? It turned out intermediate two D. There's so many useful things already done in intermediate two D that you want to inherit in the final three D design quality. For example, placement quality in intermediate two D. Commercial tool two D placer is so smart; they know exactly where to place things that need to be closer together that the system was so well done in you know in a media 2d you don't want to screw that in your final 3d essay placement so that's why this intermediate 2d is a very nice stepping stone to eventually arrive at 3d ic now a big decision again tier partitioning right so tier partitioning as i alluded in the in the first part of my presentation you can do it relatively easily manually you know, uh, you go to top, you go to bottom. If you have in you know, a good uh, information and uh, knowledge about how the overall architecture is built. But then if you do tier partitioning in module level, okay, module one, go to top, module two, go to bottom. If you have small number of modules that you can do, but then if you have lots of modules, you know, that decision is already, uh, you know, pretty a big problem. If you have 50 modules, two to the power of 50 is the number of possible solutions you have to deal with. Now, if you just move around, you know, modules, you'll get some benefit by going to 3D because the module to module, to module connection is going to be shortened, right? So there's a PPA benefit there. But you can do more. If you 
break the modules into gates, and then optimize the location of individual gates. So that's flat design approach, right? That we all know, right? And we know also that flat design is much better than hierarchical design because you now have control over each and every individual gate. So you can do fine control, you know, on whether you want to go to the same tier versus different tier. Of course, that's not going to be done in the earlier, you know, 3D IC era. Uh, uh, I mean, in the next, you know, two to three years, people will not do that for sure, right? They will just, you know, do 3D optimization using modules. But then when they're not, when they're done with that, and when they when they want to when they want to do more, then they will start thinking about you know synthesizing the modules into gates and then you know tier partition individual gates across the tier. If that's what you want to do, right? Then we found an algorithm here that's you know pretty standard basically, um, bin based hypergraph partitioning. So what happens is you're intermediate to the right. You divide the whole uh, placement into bins, large bins. And then you go into each bin, and then you will have a bunch of gates, right? Those gates, you partition it in between the top and the bottom. So we have world experts on, <laughs> on doing this exactly, uh, you know, hypergraph partitioning. Andrew and David. And um, so basically what we used was a pretty, you know, standard algorithm, uh, FM, fiducia mathesis algorithm that basically is iterative improvement. What you do, you randomly partition these gates in a bin into top and the bottom. Then you start improving the quality of the partitioning by computing gain of moving to the other side, right? Here, the gain can be in terms of many different co you know uh, cost you know uh, uh, metrics you can try and use number of connection as you know target to minimize but you can target you know uh, performance timing as a target to optimize uh, power consumption uh, thermal you know coupling so this tier partitioning cost function or gain can be defined in in in, in terms of your favorite uh, objective in any case so that was our approach, right? That was our heuristic of dividing up individual gates in between the two tiers. And then a side um, a benefit that we saw, right, was in fact, the size of the bin was very natural way to control how many connections you will have between the two tiers. If I want, okay, let's say I, I want 1,000 connections between the two tiers. I want, you know, 10,000 connections between the two tiers. What if I want 5,000 connections between the two tiers? Uh, how, do, how, do you, how, do you, how do you do tier partitioning so that, you know, you hit the target connection? You do it indirectly by changing the size of the bin. If your bin is very big, right, a single bin, Right, the cut size, number of connections, assuming FM is quite you know successful, is pretty low. FM is very good, you know, reducing the cut size. Versus, if your bin is very small, you have to do a lot of partitioning. You go to, you have to go to each and every bin, and then you do partitioning, right? So the cut size there, although number of cells is small, if you do a lot of these, the cut size summation will be quite big. So. If, you, if your bin size is small, the overall design will have more uh, connections between the tiers. If your bin is large, the overall number of connections in the entire design between the top and the bottom will be small. So that's a very natural way to control number of bins. And we, in fact, did a separate study that shows that you don't want to minimize number of connections all the time. Bin cut it may not be the best way of doing tier partitioning. Because these short connections between the tiers, in fact, will help you improve PPA. So you may not want to minimize these you know, connections all the time, in any case. All right, so that makes it a lot of sense, right? So it, this is a push button. You know, you don't need to worry about, hey, this gate going to top or bottom. You have <laughs> millions of gates, but then we have an automatic solution. So that's good, right? But then uh, we found a few problems with this. First of all, 
the timing degradation degradation now if you are into a certain bin right and you focus uh, yourself on that bin you may be able to you know address uh, cut size and maybe some timing weight related you know cut size and but you don't have the entire you know design in front of you right so if you look at a certain bin you you try and optimize your timing weighted the cut size but then if you go to another bin you forget everything that you did with the other bin <laughs> previously so it's possible that the entire timing protocol path may snake you know all over the place across all these bins the timing turned out was pretty bad now and then the second point is again about this min cut that i alluded to uh, you don't necessarily have to minimize number of cuts between the top and the bottom uh, to, to optimize BPA. But then our current approach was in fact minimizing cut size, right? So that was something that we need to overcome here. And then the last point, a weakness point that, I, uh, you know, pain point that we found out about this bin based FM was the fact that during your partitioning, because you broke everything down to gate, you lose all the hierarchical information. You forget about you know whether this gate it came from module A or module B. To you, it's just a gate. I mean, of course, there is a way to keep hierarchical information even after synthesis. But then, uh, our work right with this bin based FM ignored that hierarchical information and built top and the bottom partitioning from ground up. So these were three main things that we wanted to overcome using machine learning. So I'm wrestling, right? So uh, on the AI side, we're going to use GNN unsupervised learning to do this eight level tier partitioning between top and the bottom. And then uh, we're going to use K-means clustering to eventually build uh, the two tiers. Versus on the human side, I already told you about, uh, you know, how we use bin-based FM to do partitioning. So we're going to see how, you know, they compete and who's going to win, right? So our GNN uh, to your partitioning, again, is part of um, uh, overall uh, pseudo 3D flow, okay? So uh, our partitioning, uh, uh, GNN-based partitioning, in fact, is situated here in this entire flow of 3D IC PNR, pseudo 3D PNR. So, um, I already uh, discussed how the, the pseudo 3D, uh, you know, proceeds from netlist to the final design. So you do intermediate 2D, right, and then you do tier partitioning. And then you do legalization and routing, right? So it's this partitioning process that sits in the middle that we're trying to improve here. So the current approach that I told you about using human design heuristic is using bin-based partitioning or tile-based partitioning versus our new approach is going to use gen and based learning. Now let's move on to the next slide. So. Um, uh, GNN-based learning uh, overview, how, how does that work? Our starting point is intermediate 2D that I told you about. So what that means is before we do partitioning, I have some intermediate 2D design done. So I know where the gates are placed. Okay, so that's what you see on step one. This is intermediate 2D that, uh, that I need to convert to 3D eventually by doing partitioning. And this partitioning is what we're trying to build here. So that's step one. And all these gates, uh, the numbers, uh, uh, you know, next to the gate label uh, are their X, Y locations, right? Uh, we know this already. And then what we do is first uh, calculate the Manhattan distance among uh, these gates, right? And then we try and do some uh, pre-process, which is uh, node contraction. Uh, why? Because you know, in, in a in a typical digital circuit that's synthesized, there's so many gates, you know, millions or hundreds to millions. So we want to do some clustering to reduce the problem size. We don't want to deal with individual gates directly during gene and training. 
it's going to take a very long time. So we we will do some you know pre-process to to try and merge some of the gates, right? So here the contraction is based on the monotonous distance you know between between these gates because we already have done intermediate to the place and route. We can calculate that, and based on that distance, you know you, you can group you know these nodes together. So that's what you see on step two. And then we do GNN learning on top of this uh, contracted graph. Now, GNN learning, uh, I don't know if, uh, if you had some experience of doing this. You start with some initial features for the nodes in the graph that you're trying to, that you're using to do GNN learning. And then these features will eventually become uh, you know, uh, different kind of features that uh, that is based on your learning, right? So you need to start with some initial features before learning. And then the selection of this initial feature is pretty important because the learned features will be based basically will be based based on what you start with, right? So this is our choice. You know we use seven initial features for GN and learning. I mean, they don't have to be, you know, this. Uh, we did a lot of try and error, you know, and then we eventually decided to keep these, you know, seven. I know there's some you know, work out there that help you decide an optimal set of initial features for gene and learning. Uh, we haven't tried that yet. It was so, this was based on our, you know, try and error uh, kind of a decision process. But these features, uh, you can easily guess, you know, hierarchy information. I need that because you know these gates are synthesis, you know, coming from synthesis of some modules. So I want to keep that information. Okay, if these two gates are from the same module in my RTL or not, I want I want to remember that. And then some slack. What do you mean some slack? Um, so I, I I told you that before we do GNN learning, we contracted. You know, we we clustered uh, you know individual gates to form small size clusters, right? So then within a single node in, uh, in a cluster, you have multiple gates. So you would sum up basically the timing, uh, uh, timing worst, worst case timing slack. Then pin slew information, delay information. So this is all timing related information, which is already available because if you, if you finish your intermediate 2D design, right, then um, you already have all that timing information available, so you 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 know you want to make use of that. And then, of course, um, you want to remember uh, how many neighbors you have in the in the graph, contracted graph. Uh, the more if you have more neighbors versus if you have fewer neighbors, that also it will kind of impact uh, you know how I do tier partition eventually. So I want to make use of that information as well. And then something interesting is length of shortest path to clock source. So we want, so of course, timing is pretty important. Uh, uh, and then the clock has, has huge impact on timing. So we want to make use of some real information related to clock. So shortest path to clock source is something that we use as a feature. And these seven numbers will become 128 numbers later on during you know, GNN training. So GNN, uh, I'm sure most of you have already used this. Uh, if you haven't, GNN is you know local process. If you want to find a good uh, feature representation of this node A, you just look at your neighbors and see how how, how you know how, how they're doing, right? And based on what your neighbors are doing, decide what I'm going to do based on what my neighbors are doing. That's basically, you know, uh, you know, the, the philosophy over here. So, uh, to calculate the, the the features for A, you need to look at your neighbors B and D. So, you know, they are one hop neighbors because you just pick one hop to reach. And then, uh, if you want, you can look at more neighbors. The more neighbors you look, sometimes you know the better decision you can make for yourself, right? So, uh, in our work, uh, we used one hop and two hop neighbors. So, two hop neighbors of A is like one, two. So, E is a top neighbor, right? And then, et cetera, et cetera. So, so in this um, uh, illustration over here, uh, there's you know one hop neighbor, and then there's two hop neighbors. 
uh, we do a bottom-up approach and we propagate neighbor information from bottom to top all the way to A, right? And during that process, we will collect information from these second, you know, two hub neighbors and one hub neighbors. And when you are collecting and aggregating uh, information from your neighbors, you would do aggregation using some kind of a matrix. It's this W is, a, 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 you know, aggregation matrix that is constantly changing. This weight in you know, matrix is, 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 is being trained over here uh, during uh, that propagation, right? So that if this weight is well-trained, this will make a very good decision for uh, the node under consideration. So that's weight uh, uh, matrix. And there's also bias. Uh, again, weight and bias, you know, in, in this story pretty well from uh, deep learning algorithms. You want to do something about yourself as well so that you use bias vector to try and bias your learning in certain direction. So I won't go too much details, but then that's you know what we use to eventually decide what kind of feature A would have based on what A's neighbor has. Here is a uh, you know, simple example uh, that illustrates the overall framework of uh, forward calculation and backward calculation in, in our you know, GNN network. If you have 1,000 nodes in, in, your, in, in, your, in, in your contracted graph, right? You first need to feed uh, the graph information. You can use adjacency matrix. So 1,000 by 1,000, right? And then there's, of course, uh, uh, non-zero uh, entries will show the weights uh, between the connection, between the contracted nodes. Then, of course, I told you about uh, how we start with seven in initial features for each node. So that's the uh, initial feature matrix over here. They will both become the input to our GNN training over here. And then in, during the GNN training, uh, you would use some kind of neural network, right, to try and aggregate and add bias to collect uh, the feature for yourself, right? So this node uh, that is shown in red is exact. That's a node under consideration that I'm computing my new weight for. And when you're doing that, you look at your neighbor. And once you're done with that red node, you move on to the next node. And you look at your neighbor and you collect your information based on the, the trained uh, you know, weight matrix and uh, bias vector, et cetera, et cetera. So, so you go and uh, visit each node in the contracted graph and then collect information from your neighbors using the, uh, uh, the trained weights and trained bias. And the result is for each node in the graph, which is the row in, the, in, in this matrix, right? Embedding matrix you would end up having 128 numbers. You started with seven numbers, they become 128 numbers for each node. So you add more numbers. Basically these numbers are the ones that are produced by aggregation and biasing from your neighbors, one up neighbors and you know, two up neighbors. And after you're done with that, you're going to now start uh, updating your WNB matrix and vector by doing unsupervised learning. So this part is pretty important. Oops. Oops. I don't know where, it, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. Uh, that important slide is missing over here. But then I can basically tell you what our loss function is. Our loss function, right, is, so these 128 numbers, right? These 128 numbers represent the, the, uh, the GNN uh, features for each node. You wanna make sure that if you have a pair of nodes, their you know, um, distance in terms of 128 dimension vector, right? So you have 128 dimension you know, you know, uh, space, and then you have uh, two nodes with their own locations, you can calculate it. The, 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 the distance between these two nodes, right? You want to make sure, okay, that if these nodes are connected together, their uh, uh, distance, vector distance, right, uh, is, is, is minimized. It's a very simple loss function, you know. If not, then you want these, you know, vector representations, uh, features to, to have a larger distance between them. 
That's it. It's a very simple loss function, but this work, it works like a charm. Um, and then once you're done with the entire training, your W and B matrix and vectors do not update anymore because you know you, you're pretty much done with learning, right? And then eventually for each node, you have 128 numbers. How do you then form two partitions? How do you split these guys into top and the bottom? Right there, we use pretty standard, you know, algorithm, which is k-means clustering. So uh, you uh, you choose two centroids, right, and then you collect the nodes that are nearby the centroid, and then right, and then once you're done with that, then you can compute a new centroid location, and then you collect neighbors until the central locations don't change at all, right? So that's k-means clustering. Now, let me show you some results over here about, first of all, the quality of GNN-based features, right? So for each node, we have 128 numbers, right? We uh, reduce the dimension 128 to two, and then we plot them on XY uh, you know, space. This is principal component analysis, basically, right? So we use open p risk five you know, design, and then plot it, uh, you know, using PCA. And and guess what? <laughs> you know, these nodes are very nicely separated already in a very balanced, you know, size. If you do this kind of GNN learning, you know, partitioning was so natural because number uh, of nodes in different, you know, uh, partitions are balanced, and then their boundary is also, you know, clearly visible. We were like pretty surprised. Wow, this really happens. Right. So with this, right, we went ahead and do a partitioning, and then uh, we did the rest, of course. So over here, we use this unit partitioning to do the partitioning, and then we did the the back end of the things. You you did placement legalization and routing and time enclosure with two tiers now. Okay. Everything that's happened before partitioning was 2D, commercial intermediate 2D. But everything that happens after partitioning is 3D timing optimization, 3D, you know, uh, placement legalization, 3D uh, routing, right? 3D. So we have tools for doing that. So we did that. And then we eventually built GDS layout. Um, we used, again, uh, OpenPython Risk Five. We used, in fact, seven benchmarks. Uh, we're just showing you one of them. We did logical logic, so we have memory models in both tiers. Face to face hybrid bond. Um, uh, I believe each and are you here? The the hybrid bond pad pitch was like. Uh, yes. What was, what was it? The the pitch. Oops, we lost that. So <laughs> I'm gonna guess it's a single digit micron. Okay, <laughs> and uh, TSM is twenty eight. So what you see, what you see on the left is um, uh, based on machine learning tier partitioning. So we're showing you the top tier GDS uh, memory and then routing shown. Uh, on the bottom is bottom tier GDS of, of the same benchmark. And then on the right hand side, we're showing you. Uh, we have done some work uh, early on. So uh, strong 2D is another flow that we published a few years back with Qualcomm. So that's uh, the design that we obtain using bin-based FM. So that's basically bin-based FM. The, you, what you see on the right is human, right? And what you see on, on the left is machine learning based tier partitioning. So here is the verdict. So now uh, we can just focus on the top half. Uh, the bottom half is other circuit. Um, open Python, right? Effective frequency. Uh, compared with strong 2D, we're better. In fact, we were you know, quite pleased to see that you know we were able to improve FMAX by 27%. I'm pretty happy. In fact, wild length was even better too. This genome based learning was in fact quite useful in reducing wild length by 7.7. .7. So we calculate energy. Again, looks pretty good. Uh, footprint was set to be the same between trunk 2D and uh, this uh, TPGNN, uh, tier partitioning based on GNN. Uh, we ended up using more uh, uh, tier to tier vias 
30% more. And this is the point I wanted to make. You don't necessarily have to use minimum number of connections between the tiers to optimize VPA. In some cases, using more it could be better. And indeed, that is the case that we, we, we saw here. And uh, of course, you have to spend, you know, you have to do GNN learning. So it, it, it took longer time to finish the design. So what I want to do, I, I don't think I would have time at all to touch up on the second word. So I'm going to stop here and then I'm going to answer a question. Actually, thank you. Hi, Andrew. Hey, hi. Can you flip through your slides like once a second so that people on the video can at least freeze frame them and know what, <laughs> okay. know what they missed, perhaps? Is that doable? We'll do. Yeah, just of yes. course, of course. Yeah. yeah just uh, we can take 15 seconds and then come back okay. to this stopping point. Perhaps. Yeah, we'll do. By the way, you know, I'll be happy to share, you know, these, you know, these slides with everyone who attended this. Right. Oh, we were going to yep. ask. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry to interrupt. No, not um, at all. Not at all. I mean, okay. yeah, that was, Thanks. yeah. Was, you have a yeah, bunch very... of questions, I see. <laughs> okay. So okay. second book is about uh, using gone to do clock tree synthesis, mm -hmm. right? By the way, this is not actually 3D. Uh, we don't have too many papers on 3D. So this was in fact 2D, I see. Uh, in any case, um, now this is about making users of EDA tools smarter. So, uh, if you do a clock tree synthesis, uh, if you have done it, right, you, you would have to set, you know, several parameters, key parameters, for example, target skew, I want target, target skew to be that much, maximum fan out to be this much, maximum uh, cap on the trunk side, maximum cap on the leaf side, so the target on the trunk and leaf. And depending on how you set these knobs or parameters, you may get very different results. <laughs> Right, power skew, quite different. Just by you know doing visual inspection, tree one is much better than tree two in terms of wide length and power. But surprisingly, the skew is better in tree two. So if you have done a lot of you know uh, you know this kind of design for ten years, do you know exactly what these you know knobs do and how these knobs interact with each other and affect each other? But if you don't, right, how do you how how do you tune these parameters? So we uh, ask machine learning, machine learning algorithm to do this tuning for us. On top of that, in machine learning, we ask them to predict what would the skew you will get, what would the power you would get without doing bug routing. So here, the starting point is flop placement. And then without doing clock routing, what would be the best skew at one length you would get and then what are the parameters that will give you those results, right? We use gone, generator, discriminator. It's a pretty standard, you know, formulation, the supervised learning. So we need to build a database so that we can use it to teach the discriminator. Um, one thing that is quite unique in this work was the fact that we use layout images and extract features and use them to train both generator and the discriminator. That was our distinguishing feature over in this work. So why images, right? Uh, what images? We use trial route uh, snapshots and flop location and clock net routing, right? And then we use Resident 50, which is pre-trained. So, you know, this guy knows exactly how to extract key features from the given image. And we can, so we extract 128, 128, 128 numbers from these, you know, images and then we concatenate them. And then we also concatenate with it uh, some, you know, metadata from that list, like number of flops. And, and we eventually, you know, uh, brought it down using DNN layers. And we did, uh, again, PC analysis, right? It turned out PCA, the way this image helps is it helps us distinguish different circuits. You know, as you can see, these groups of nodes are different benchmarks. You see, this is sort of like a learning from what expert designers do. If you're an expert designer, before you do, you know, clock routing, you look at flop placement, right? Okay, um, all right. I, I think I saw this kind of flop, flop placement before. 
Okay, so maybe I want to tune that parameter like that, right? And if you have different kind of a flaw placement, okay, and I based on what I see with my bare eyes, maybe I want to tune that parameter like that. So this layout image with flaw placement, you know, visual information. Right? In fact, if you're a human designer, can provide some hint about how you tune these parameters, right? So that we can do it with this, you know, image extracted um, features. So for the generator discriminator, we use standard, you know, there's nothing fancy. Uh, GNN layers, and um, uh, the result is uh, using this gone, right? Uh, we tune the parameters and we compare that to commercial auto setting, which is not too good. I, we know, we know that, but then still we don't have any other baseline. Uh, we were able to improve the baseline quite a bit actually. <laughs> Uh, for this unseen that list, you know, we use some 10 circuits to train the gone, and then we use you know, some seven circuits to uh, do inferencing, right? Using that the generator, right? To produce uh, fake clock parameters for new circuits. So one of these new circuits gave us huge saving. So that was like a you know, five minute <laughs> summary of my second part. I see how this can be, you know, uh, extended to 3D. I see that we haven't finished yet. Yeah. So maybe I can answer questions. You have a conclusion, slide? <laughs> Sorry, thank you. you <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh... Actually, yeah, well, that's oh, my okay. conclusion. Right. <laughs> yeah. Ah, there's even more than 33. Yeah, there are quite some <laughs> questions. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was, yes. Okay. Okay. Oh, thanks for Professor Lin for the great talk. We have a few questions here. So there's a question from Jia Qi. He's asking, uh, regarding the partitioning-based placement, could you share any insights that how to compare the partition-based and the direct 3D placement, for example, ePlace 3D? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, if your placement engine is smarter, then you can skip partitioning and go directly to 3D placement. But if you do partitioning and your problem becomes a lot easier. But again, that doesn't stop you from doing a direct 3D placement instead of going through a partitioning first. Okay, great. Now let me see. I think that's the question on the chat right now. So. If anyone of the audience have other questions, please feel free to put put into in the chat. I have a quick follow-up. I see that Yichen gave the pitch of the MIV as slightly less than one micron. The pitch oh. is less than one micron in this technology, which I feel like you fabricated at 28 and I see, if I'm I see. not misrecollecting the slide, that's a so surprisingly that, low low number. Right, right. So now remember uh, what each did for that paper. I think uh, the bonding technology that we assumed was monolithic, not ah, um, okay. heavy bonding. Yeah, uh, monolithic. Yes, it's monolithic right? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yep. And Z Wang, which I suspect is Yang Wang. Did did your uh, yeah. question get answered uh, by Yi Chen? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Karen. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Karen, this is yeah. a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, just go ahead with some more questions, I think. Uh, so you can also scroll back the chat, right? I guess, to see some other questions. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Where where do I start? Uh, I think one question is from this way. Uh, how does the loss function reflect the corresponding metric like cut size and timing? Right? I guess you have about the GIN training worker. This from Z Wang. Uh, Jia from me. <laughs> oh, okay, Jia. Okay, sorry. <laughs> oh, Jia, right. Okay, so I'll let the each and answer that question. So your your, your loss function uh, in your GNN partitioning, how does that affect uh, the uh, 
the metrics? Yeah. The, metrics. Um, the, the short answer is that we are not directly taking the cost size, like to calculate the probability of the cost size as a loss function, but we are trying to do kind of a contrastive learning that we want to um, increase the similarity. I mean, the node representation similarity between a node and it's like one a few hubs within neighbors while minimizing the, that similarity to the nodes that are far away of the target node. So if when we, after having this learning, when we do the k-means clustering, the nodes that are being uh, more similar to each other will have a higher probability of being clustered together. So they will belong to the same tier with a higher probability. So that um, in this way, we, we can kind of um, minimizing the a short connection in 2D being partitioned into different tiers so as to prevent the creation of long 3D connection. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your answer. So maybe something I can ask you a, a last a quick question, maybe more bigger picture. So you, this uh, the partition that you do it for uh, monolithic, right? And uh, of course, at the beginning, you also show the TSV and microbone. Those are more for the heterogeneous or monolithic or both. <laughs> I guess what's your view about the future? I guess we talk about this during that, right? So uh, it should be monolithic plus heterogeneous or <laughs> what's your view? <laughs> It's a multi-general question. Yeah. So, so for now, the industry is working very hard on hybrid bonding and micro-bonding. And we, or, we already have some commercial products based on these bonding technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, these technologies will definitely be polished up. So the pitch will reduce further, right? So uh, Intel Forbearance 50 micron, uh, they have roadmap to bring it all the way down to 10. And in TSMC, hybrid bonding currently is 10 micron. Again, they have roadmap to go down to one micron and sub-micron, right? Monolithic, on the other hand, which I thought would come soon, <laughs> it looks like it's going to be quite delayed. Mm. Uh, the foundries are very interested in killer apps for monolithic. They, have, for some reason, have very you know, interesting confidence, okay? That if someone tells them, the killer F for monolithic, they can build the process very quick. Well, I don't know if that's really the case or not, but then it's about, you know, um, killer apps. In case of monolithic, they already have a lot of uh, several important technologies already built up, you know, sequential process, right? Um, uh, 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 hydrogen cut right? Low temperature process. All these process innovations uh, in, in, in some format, you know, already exist. It's just that you know, they're, they're not quite willing to bet, bet more money on pushing a monolithic further until they see a clear uh, killer app. I see. So, uh, yeah, so I would see, again, Andrew was pretty shocked, right? That monolithic via pitches like you know, sub-micron. Again, when we no, chose no, that... No. I, I, I know about that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was uh, because it was in a slide that talked about hybrid bonding, so I was yeah. confused. I guess. Yeah, yeah. So that's not going to happen anytime soon. Monolithic is going to take some time. Well, okay. Uh, let's thank uh, uh, Professor Ling again. Uh, There's for, a uh, oh, okay, sure. Oh, but uh, sure. maybe some of you can answer uh, JW Park's question in chat as we move yeah, on yeah. to, to show yeah, sure. this talk. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So much. Thank you. I thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, uh, all right, so uh, we have uh, the next talk uh, uh, on a slightly different topic, but very important on verification. Right? So we have uh, uh, Shona, uh, sorry, Shoba uh, Vasu uh, Desen. Uh, he, she was a former professor at the UIUC and the current adjunct professor, but she joined the Google full-time, uh, I think last year. And uh, 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 she actually uh, graduated from UT Austin, right? So um, let's uh, see, right? So uh, Shona, uh, Shoba actually, uh, her research area covers uh, various aspects of AI and ML systems you know, verification and so on and so forth, right? So between 2019 and 2022, uh, she was a research scientist at the brand team in Google Research. Uh, actually yesterday, uh, Zhou Jiang also give, from Google brand team uh, gave a talk, right? but uh, she works on a slightly different topic on more on the verification side. 
So, um, and uh, she was a tenured professor at uh, UIUC before joining uh, Google full time. She has got uh, many awards, including NSF Career Award, SEM Sigta Outstanding uh, New Faculty Award, uh, IEEE Early Career Award, UIUC Dean's Award, uh, and so IBM Faculty, many awards, <laughs> Google Faculty Awards, and so on and so forth. So, so um, she also actually, interestingly, besides the technical uh, activities in the community, she is also very uh, involved in local school districts uh, for K-5 STEM educations. So uh, Shoba, uh, the floor is yours. Let me share my screen. Thank Hi, you, Dave. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, do you think I can share? Uh, you can share the screen. Yeah, absolutely. Follow is yours. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, I can see your screen. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Oh, Shoba, you are muted. Hi, Shoba, uh, you are muted somehow. Can you unmute? Okay. Oh, yeah. can, you, can you hear me now? But I still can't uh, see the screen and the people at the same time. So if, uh, I don't know how you want to do this, David, would you, uh, is there, should I look for questions during the talk or should we keep uh, it? Going? Yeah, just uh, just finish your talk maybe in 15 minutes and then uh, there are questions and answers in the chat, right? So we can, uh, if there's any, yeah, we will just handle all the questions toward the end. How about that? Yeah. Okay, 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 that, that works. All right, thank you very much, uh, David, for the kind introduction. I'm uh, very happy to be talking about um, some of the work that uh, we have been doing uh, within Google Research. So as David uh, introduced me, uh, the work that I've been doing in the past a couple of years uh, has uh, culminated in a, in a couple of publications, which I will be uh, summarizing in this talk. Um, mainly, there is this publication in Europe 2021, which started most, which kind of, uh, the, most of the talk revolves around that. And there is a little more uh, additional uh, stuff that we are seeing post uh, the publication of that paper. So maybe I'll have a chance to go into that as well. So if you want more details, um, please go ahead and look at the Europe 2021 paper. So the topic I'm going to talk about today is uh, how do you learn representations of hardware designs? Um, in this uh, work, there's, there have been a bunch of collaborators. Uh, some of them are also co-authors on the paper, uh, but, uh, but uh, all of them are uh, uh, people without whom this work would not have happened and they are all from Google. So in order to motivate why we should learn representations for hardware designs, I will start by talking about an application uh, where these representations or the learning of these representations is useful. Uh, within the hardware design cycle, one of the applications that is uh, considered a, the long pole of the hardware chip design cycle is verification. So design verification, i.e. Uh, the process of checking whether an implementation satisfies a specification or not, is considered a uh, bottleneck. And the reason it's considered a bottleneck, both from an, uh, from an uh, analytical or an intellectual uh, research problem perspective, as well as a practical industrial perspective, is that uh, this problem has uh, an issue, a fundamental issue of scale. So let's see what that uh, means in a little more detail. So design verification typically takes uh, three months or so uh, to basically generate uh, a few tests, like 100,000 tests. And then it takes more than a year to actually debug and diagnose issues with those tests and to increase the tests and bring the coverage to 100%. The goal of design verification is zero bugs and 100% coverage. 
And this roughly takes about uh, more than a year, like I would say like 18 months of effort uh, with 15 to 20 verification engineers, sometimes much more. Uh, in a typical, like in a ground up chip, it's even more, it's close to like 100. Uh, and, and towards the end, this number keeps on increasing and verification is usually in the uh, in, in, in the in the uh, in, in the timeline uh, graphs is almost is almost always the one with the long red lines, and this basically uh, tends to severely affect like uh, chip timelines and leading to very uh, massive costs and uh, in, in time and resources. So uh, a typical the, the, this is a, a practical example, a real example where uh, a lot of verification was done between an AXI master and an AXI slave, different RTL modules, and both of these checked out just fine after extensive, after this kind of verification, where, uh, you know, after a year, basically, uh, of different components in the RTL design checked out just fine. But then when they were put together uh, in the system, then, some, then something uh, uh, broke in a, in, a, in a way that it never had before. And then this corner case um, uh, data read or write request uh, was something that you know caused a severe deadlock, and that had never been seen before. The scenario had never been seen during pre-silicon verification, but it was found in the uh, as a silicon bug uh, in the lab after hours and hours of post-silicon validation. So basically, uh, I mean, since in in that case, uh, you know, the the workaround was in software, uh, but then uh, the point is that uh, despite this many, despite like 50 man uh, person years of uh, uh, effort, uh, which is, you know, 40 people doing this for a year or more, there was still uh, a bug that could, uh, you know, that was that very profoundly affected the working of that chip. So that just goes to show that this process is really incomplete and ad hoc and unsystematic. Uh, so coming back to, you know, why that is, or why is the verification problem so hard in the first place? Uh, let's think of let's talk about a bit about this question of what what verification really is. So the fundamental verification question is one of reachability analysis. So reachability analysis is uh, given in some initial state. Can we reach uh, another given state of the system from some initial from known initial states? Uh, and all of the verification questions or verification tasks can somehow be phrased in terms of reachability analysis. So it's considered a very fundamental computation in the field. Uh, so the research question that we asked and that pertains to this talk is, can we, now, can we use a deep neural network model that allows us to predict state reachability? And then will such a model help scale verification? So I have to um, talk a bit of, uh, here. I, uh, I, I, I think I should talk a bit here about uh, the use, the, the kind of alternate or different use of deep learning in this context. So of course, we are used to deep learning, mimicking human tasks, recognizing images, natural language, language understanding, and so on. But um, there is a branch of um, uh, um, of, of, or, or there is a line of work of applying ML for systems as David uh, and, and other uh, experts have also been working on. And these kinds of, uh, and these techniques for applying ML for systems are typically about applying them to uh, systems where scale is a big issue. So scaling the analysis beyond whatever has already existed. Uh, and, and there's many examples of this, even outside hardware. So people have done uh, this kind of ML-based analysis or ML-based um, uh, ML, ML, ML based solutions for program synthesis, compiler optimizations, uh, instruction prefetch at the microarchitecture level, debugging, and so on. So uh, in some sense, this belong, this work belongs to that category. I think ML for chip design in general, and particularly this one, belongs to this broader category of ML for systems. And uh, there is a very different and distinct flavor 
to ML for systems as compared to the traditional use of ML. So uh, as we go along, I encourage you to think about, you know, to draw parallels in your head about the typical way in which a model would be trained, a, a question would be, a, a, an ML task would be formulated, and the way that we are doing it uh, in this task. So, uh, you know, just uh, it's interesting to kind of see how we are proposing the use of ML in this kind this category of thing and then how we are using it. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the model itself, uh, the details of the model and the training are presented in Europe 2021. I'll try my best to cover uh, how much ever I can in a given time. Uh, but the idea behind what, behind trying to use deep learning for RTL designs is to generate, is to create a learning of the design itself. What does the design do? What are its semantics? And what are its semantics in, uh, in particular with respect to uh, verification tasks? And that is why this question right here is important, because if we answer this question for a single for reachability analysis, essentially we are we could we should be theoretically able to answer it for all the verification tasks. OK, so. Let's talk a bit about what learning hardware designs means with representations. So representation learning has been a, uh, a an avid area of research in, um, uh, in, in, in ML research in uh, Europe and other communities. Uh, people have not shown that it is possible to do for hardware designs until this paper. And what this paper uh, did was basically uh, what we did here was to say, if we have an RTL design, then what are the ways that you can represent the RTL design? How can you featureize the RTL design in a way that representation learning can make the most of it? And representation learning is a branch of uh, machine learning where, uh, where, where, where uh, learned representations, whether they are of the form of graphical representations or language models and so on, can then be can be used to actually um, uh, to inform the neural network of better uh, for better inferencing. So uh, so in this case, we basically had uh, the, the couple of representations that we uh, that we thought would give uh, enough context to the neural network. Uh, one of them uh, would be a graphical model, which I will explain shortly. And the other one is to actually uh, provide the source code of the RTL itself. So like uh, um, based on uh, whatever uh, we, so we decided not to go down to the gate level because uh, there's too much information there and it's, and it's likely not very digestible by a neural network. But at the level of RTL, uh, it's possible to be able to at least isolate, uh, you know, the natural language like code constructs as well as, uh, you know, uh, take the assistance of things like uh, line numbers for sequencing, as well as uh, the graphical representation of different components of the design. And the idea was to be able to provide some kind of representation. And this neural network model, uh, we call design to VEC, uh, because it vectorizes uh, the design, so that is, uh, the theme. Uh, so th that's the, the uh, that, that's the context of the name. So before delving into more details about how we do it, I do want to establish some context in light of other methods in verification which have existed uh, for a long, long time. Right. So since uh, we started designing chips, we've been wondering how to verify them because at every stage that we have designed chips, we have been way more ambitious about uh, the chips themselves than about than what the actual verification technology is and the reality of the actual tech verification technologies that we had. So at any point of time, uh, we've always built chips that we that we don't know how to verify uh, because our the computational capacity has almost never matched the complexity of the chips that we design. So we are, that is always uh, kind of falling behind. So the research around verification has always has has um, had a pretty long uh, and you know illustrious uh, uh, history, and some of this uh, needs a nod and needs. I mean, we need to acknowledge that all of it exists before you know uh, embarking on this brand new deep deep neural network based solution. So here's some context. Uh, so there's different. So at the at the top of the, this pyramid here, this is a pyramid of different kinds of solutions for verification. 
And at the top of the pyramid is dynamic analysis or simulation. This one uses a uh, very concrete representation, which means it's a, it's a, it's testing essentially of the RTL design. Uh, this is very scalable uh, because this is uh, this is what we use in industry. Why is it scalable? Because it's doing uh, stuff one at a time. It's concrete instances of the uh, design. Uh, it is, of course, practical. This is what we use for taping our chips for uh, so many decades. Uh, it does need it, it kind of in the limit. It basically needs infinite time, which basically which means that in order to exhaustively uh, simulate every one of the inputs or input sequences, you would uh, you would basically uh, need uh, a long time. Uh, this is this tends to be, as I mentioned, the ad hoc and systematic and it's a manual time and resourcing. This is the thing that takes 50 percent years. At the bottom of the pyramid is the uh, is static methods to do RTL analysis, static methods for verification. What does that mean? These uh, these include uh, formal verification based methods or fact based methods or methods that do RTL level analysis and so on. In all these cases, there is a, they, they construct an exact representation of the design, either at the, as a state transition graph or as a, uh, as a control data flow graph or uh, whatever have you, term rewriting system. They have a lot of ways in which they model the design. These are exact ways. There's complete knowledge about the design. And this, is, this tends to be a completely exhaustive analysis. But like in, uh, in all cases, they're uh, exhaustive. Uh, in all exhaust in, ca in cases where exhaustive is used, uh, there is an issue, a fundamental issue of computational capacity and the inability to scale uh, beyond small modules. So in some sense, this needs infinite space at the bottom of the pyramid. The one at the top of the pyramid needs infinite time. So it's a very hard problem uh, in uh, P space uh, complexity uh, and, and P it's, it's P space complete. And basically there is a uh, between this spectrum between static and dynamic analysis, uh, one needs infinite time and one needs infinite space. This is just to give context to those who are not aware of uh, the framing of the verification problem. Uh, there are other solutions that have uh, been thought of by researchers through the decades. Some of them are uh, as so, uh, uh, static plus dynamic analysis. And static plus dynamic is much better than static in terms of scalability. Uh, but it is still impractical because of the extent of um, because of uh, the, the size of complexity of the circuits that we design of designs uh, that we simply don't have uh, the time or space uh, to be able to do even to, to be able to do any ex any amount of static analysis essentially. Uh, and it's also limited by the concrete traces. So the more uh, due to the concrete uh, simulation values that we are hybridizing with, with the static uh, approaches, this the, the concrete traces limit the, the applicability. Uh, there is a, another category of um, applying static analysis with ML techniques. And these are non deep learning techniques uh, before uh, designed to vec these were all non deep learning techniques. And uh, these tend to be much more scalable than any of the other approaches uh, or much more scalable than the other static analysis approaches. Uh, and the, uh, and, and uh, they are uh, they, so they are very good as compared to the others. But they are uh, but the situation and I have worked in a bunch of these for um, uh, a host of different uh, problems like root causing test generation, etc. Uh, the problem here is that it needs to be handcrafted for a particular task. And there's a lot of feature engineering that goes into it because this is not non deep learning. So this is standard uh, ML like decision trees or random forests or SVMs and there's a lot of there's literally it used to be a, a PhD to get to be able to get uh, the right set of algorithms that could perform a task for a class of designs and so on. So the of that last method is of uh, the last last uh, class of methods is uh, questionable. So um, what we decided to do in this work was to apply deep learning and the purpose of using deep learning is uh, that deep learning essentially uses 
or creates an approximation of whatever training data you provided. So if you provide a bunch of training data to it, then it is uh, then the functions that it is learning implicitly are complex abstractions of whatever that training data is. So if we now use that principle in what we are trying to do, then the RTL simulations are now our training data. And we are essentially searching for some kind of an approximation of the RTL simulator. So whether it's a simulator, uh, so depending on whatever traces we present, that would be the approximation that is learned. So now again, as uh, like I mentioned in the previous case, having a uh, if we only relied on the training data and we did not provide any other information about the design, then what the deep learning engine would learn would be an approximation of that training data. OK, so I want you to keep that in mind as we uh, move to the next couple of slides. So we asked the question. Can we use simulation data to learn a tractable continuous representation that can predict answers to state reachability queries in hardware? OK, so not only do we provide the simulation data, but we also want to provide the natural language and the graphical representations. And the reason to do this is because, with, as I just mentioned, with pure simulation data, the approximation that would be learned would be based on, would be as good as the quality of training data or simulation data that was used to train this model. And given that uh, we were using random simulations, uh, we cannot assure that uh, a part of the design that is very hard to reach or a part of the design that is not obvious or not represented would be learned by the model. So in order to represent uh, the rest of the parts of the design, we, we used the, um, the graphs and the uh, RTL uh, language and this, the source code. And uh, together, we hope that that approximation that was learned with, with the, with, with the uh, featureization of the entire design space, essentially, and the particular simulations that triggered different concrete instances of that design space, the total approximation of the function that would be learned would be good enough to do what is fundamentally important in verification. It would be good enough to scale. This was the bet that we made. Uh, let me talk a bit about how we did it. Uh, so as so the one of the, so this, if, if you leave this talk, with nothing else than this slide, I feel I would have done my job because this slide essentially captures the concept of what we were trying to do. And it's, it was uh, at the time that we started it, it was uh, pretty uh, radical to do this because it was not clear that a discrete representation, a complete discrete state space representation would be able to uh, be represented as a continuous representation that made any sense and that could predict answers in a reasonable way. So um, now that that context has been established, we are going to talk a bit about this, you know, how we did these different components. So let's first start with the graph. Modeling RTL as a control data flow graph uh, is, is, has been done before. I've done it in my own research uh, for a number of years. Uh, this is not an innovation of this work, but uh, but it is not uh, extremely obvious. So I will go over a couple of slides around it because uh, this is not the state transition graph. This is a control data flow graph. So it's it's viewing the RTL as a as if it was software and going through uh, building control data flow around just the RTL level stuff. So we're not going and bit blasting and doing state transition level representations. So right here, if you have, uh, there are three always blocks, and each of these always blocks can be represented as different. Each of these are different processes, so each of them can be represented <coughs> as these uh, separate processes right here in the graph. And the dotted line uh, between say N4 and N9 or N8 and N9, those are basically the uh, connections between these always blocks that kind of represent the implicit connections. Uh, between the always blocks. Uh, so 
we find that so the branch when we refer to a branch here and i will be referring to branches in the next few slides a branch over here is uh, like what you would imagine in software uh, in this case it would be n1 n2 uh, n4 in the first always block uh, n5 n6 n8 uh, in the second in the blue always block and n9 n10 n12 um, in the in the third always block so that's the it's a, a branch is uh, exactly what you would imagine in, uh, as in software. A path, though, we uh, we distinguish a bit between the, the word branch and, uh, and path because the paths are more global. And so we try to, uh, so a path is essentially uh, one that can go across uh, different always blocks or different processes. So in this case, it would be N1, N2, N4, N9, N10, N12. So that is an, a, a sequence that follows all the way until from the beginning of that module to the end of that module. So of course there can be longer paths. So if this module is instantiated in uh, in in another uh, by a top module, then it's a much longer path. So there are paths, there are branches, and there are nodes in this graph. And each of these nodes are uh, represented by uh, n uh, with an index. Uh, so. Our problem, the first problem that we uh, we tried design to work for was that was uh, connected to uh, tracing coverage or to finding coverage. So coverage in this graph uh, can be defined as the uh, following. So let's say that we got an input stimulus from a test, uh, which is uh, which has uh, values on C, D, P, and Q as one, zero, zero, and zero. Uh, for that input stimulus, this module would stimulate uh, a, a, along the red arrows or the red and the red dotted line. So uh, then, so the way we would say this is when there is a single input stimulus from this test, the path that was activated was N1, N3, N4, N9, N10, N12. Okay. So then uh, in terms of coverage, we would say that this input stimulus or this test covered this path covered the red path. Okay, so this test, so test uh, C test uh, one zero zero zero. This vector covered the red path. That's how we would uh, we would phrase this. So now, uh, having said that, the next uh, our our next uh, so our task itself, the task that we train the neural network on, that is a task for coverage prediction and coverage prediction I'll, uh, so let's let's see what that means so coverage prediction uh, is a task where we basically provide training data which involves all uh, a bunch of different tests which are randomly generated and different points of the design that were covered by that test so the rows correspond to the tests the columns correspond to the different branch cover points that were covered by that test, okay, as in the previous example. So these tests are generated at random, and uh, the points that are covered are marked with a green X in the uh, matrix. So our training data involves some subset of tests that were ran randomly generated. Uh, most of the time it was between 2,000 to 4,000 tests, no more, for any average sized uh, block. Uh, and and uh, then the cover points, the branch cover points that were covered by that test. That's our training data. Now, you notice that the points here between C7 and Cn are not uh, part of the training data and they are not because they are not covered by any of the tests. Okay. So then, the, 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 the learning task or the prediction task is given a new unseen test, a test that this model has never seen, would it be able to predict which of the cover points of the design are covered by that test? Okay, so that's the, that's the prediction task. So it's trained on the, some tests and the points covered by that test, branch coverage of that test, but for a new test, what is the branch coverage? What exactly are the number of points that are covered? So unseen test, unseen cover points. That's what we are trying to, uh, uh, that, that's what we're trying to predict. 
So Design Direct, our tool, uh, has an architecture that is based on graph neural networks. So as you can see, uh, there are graph neural, uh, so there is a graph neural network fundamentally uh, that forms the uh, the heart of this uh, model, and the graph neural network learns both uh, control and data flow in hardware execution. Uh, there is a cover point. So, if, so if you see the architecture, there's two towers here. One of them has a cover point embedding. Uh, one of them generates a cover point embedding and the other one generates an embedding for the test parameters. Because if you remember from here, from this picture, there is, the, these are the two components of what we are trying to learn. There's tests and there's cover point. So the tests are embedded uh, on, on um, one of the towers. On the second tower, the cover points are embedded. And uh, for the cover point embedding, we use um, a graph neural network that we uh, use to learn uh, the control data flow graph that I just showed here. So this, this kind of control data flow graph for the full design is learned using the graph neural network. Um, we also use at the lower, uh, below the graph neural network, this part of the architecture that is, uh, that demonstrates like a certain amount of uh, language modeling. Uh, it says word to vec here, but we don't use word to vec uh, we, uh, it, we use more, more, uh, slightly more complex language modeling of RTL tokens in order to uh, embed these different tokens, which are the RTL source code, and that is also provided as features to the graph neural network. At the end of that uh, phase, we have a node embedding. Oh, oops, sorry. We have at the end of that phase, we basically generate a node embedding for every single node in the graph. And if you remember from the figure here, every single node corresponds to a statement in the RTL. So for every single node in the graph, uh, a node embedding is generated. And uh, from these, a certain for a particular cover point. So again, going back to this figure, if you see here, a cover point is in this case is uh, in this case, uh, N1, N3, N4, uh, then N9, N10, and N12. This is the entire path of which the cover points would be each of these nodes, because all of those are nodes that would get Xs in this figure for the test that we showed here. So for this test, uh, all um, six of these nodes would get an X in this figure. Okay, so those are the, the kind of the branch cover points. So uh, we basically had, um, yeah, so over here we take, so a cover point basically is a sequence of nodes and it's a, it's a, it's a branch, so it's a local branch. So a cover point would be a sequence of nodes and for each of these cover points, we uh, generate a cover point embedding on top of the node embedding. And then we use some uh, other, uh, uh, so, you know, lighter neural network technology to kind of get us to, to fuse these different nodes and form the final cover point embedding. So, and then we uh, concatenate both the uh, uh, embeddings from the two towers, and then we uh, use an MLP to basically predict if a cover point is hit or it's not hit. Okay. So, and the reason, so, uh, a reason why we did not, this is a reason, this is a question we get often, uh, why are there two towers in this architecture instead of keep, instead of making the test parameter uh, kind of come in much earlier into the pipe, into the ML learning pipeline. Uh, the reason to do this is because we want to keep the cover point embedding agnostic to the particular task. So in this case, the task is to predict coverage of a test. So in this case, we would be interested in the test parameter embedding. If we were to use design to vec for a different task, for let's say for um, uh, let's say for assertion coverage or for generating assertions or for root causing or debugging and so on, we would still be able to use uh, the cover point embedding uh, or any you know node embedding within the design graph, agnostic of exactly what is the uh, other task. So that's the reason we maintained this. Um, uh, separation between these two towers. So uh, one more thing that I would like to touch upon very briefly, uh, but it's uh, but more details in the paper uh, is the concept of an instruction pointer analysis based GNN 
or an IPA GNN. And what this is, is like it, it is a variation of a regular graph neural network or GNN uh, by adding instruction pointer analysis to it. So in a, uh, this, has, this is not an invention of our paper, but this is an invention uh, that was made within Google Brain uh, for one of our other, uh, uh, so for a, for a different, in a different context, for software dynamic path uh, learning, for code uh, path learning as a part of program synthesis. Uh, this was a technology that was developed and we found that it was particularly useful for what we were trying to do. So we repurposed the IPA GNN um, model for what we were trying to do. And, and part of our research was to figure out if that's much better than an ordinary GNN for learning the kinds of things that we wanted to learn. And, uh, and if you see what that uh, really does is basically it's able to, the, it's a program control flow aware GNN, which means that it's an ordinary GNN basically learns uh, based on neighborhood. So it, it learns, uh, so its neighbor, its neighbors are basically defined as, uh, it, it's a very well, it, it's a very clear definition what are the neighbors of a given node in the GNN. For the IPA GNN, it's not based on uh, clusters of neighbors or neighborhood of a node, but the learning is uh, proceeds on the basis of how the instruction pointer in the program moves. So it's, it's essentially, uh, morphing the graph uh, neural network learning, it's skewing it in terms of what is likely to appear, what ends up appearing next in your uh, training data. So it's kind of, it, it assigns probabilities to what is the next uh, statement that will be executed in the control flow. So in that, uh, so in um, the case of R R RTL IPA GNN, we modeled the IPA GNN uh, to mirror the RTL semantics. And uh, what that means is that we would be able to do uh, module level execution. And we keep in mind the module level execution, uh, or we keep track of the module level execution using the uh, IPA GNN, and also, uh, which also tracks how the control uh, point, instruction pointer moves between the uh, different parts of uh, RTL. The difference between RTL IPA GNN and the regular IPA GNN is that in software, there is a single instruction pointer which moves in sequence throughout the program. Uh, in hardware, in RTL, this is, it's a parallel program. So there's, a, uh, the instruction pointer isn't situated in any one point. So in some sense, there is a global clock that uh, makes the entire design execute at the same time. So the, all modules are executing uh, at least so executing one statement in every clock cycle roughly. And that's what we are trying to model with the IPA GNN, that, that this parallelism across different modules. That's the novelty in, in doing that here. And um, so uh, as I, and, and there's a other, couple of other semantic differences between RTL and software is that RTL uh, has a looping back from the end uh, of an always lock to the beginning. And uh, it has many disconnected components instead of a single connected component. So the RTL version of this um, graph neural network model is fairly, is, is entirely different uh, than the uh, software version of this model. So that's also something uh, that's an innovation of this work, uh, which we needed in order to uh, kind of get our best results. So going to the experiments, uh, we had, three uh, different baselines uh, for design to x So design to x is the model with all of the um, structure and the architecture built in as we've talked about so far. Uh, the three different baselines um, are to show, uh, so we, we wanted to answer two different questions here. First of all, does representation learning perform better than no representation learning? What that, uh, what, why do we have to answer that question? Well, if we never did any of the graphs or we never did the natural language based or the source code representations, would we still get the same benefit from using deep neural networks as we uh, as we do now? 
Okay, and there, and and uh, that that basically means if you remember uh, back in the approximation slide, I had showed you uh, the idea of tr of training data being approximated versus training plus graph plus source code data being approximated. So the first question here is, do we need the plus graph and the plus source code, or can we just use simulation data approximate, and is that good enough? Okay, that's the first question. The second question is um, between, so does GNN based message propagation uh, perform better than other learned structural representations? So this is more of an ML question, uh, which is that if you hadn't, do you really need to use a graph neural network? Um, or can you just use uh, other structural representations which are, uh, which are learning a lot about the structure of the code? Uh, code? So our third baseline is something which actually learned a lot of different structure, but didn't use a GNN. Uh, the second baseline is uh, to use some amount of representation. So uh, the, we, we encoded the cover points as one hot identity vectors. So we provided some context essentially between the cover points. And the first one is, uh, just statistical baseline statistical frequency just using and in all these three cases we just used an mlp not uh, nothing fancy just a, a five stage mlp so uh, <clears throat> okay so um, and these are some differences about each of these uh, baselines so uh, in the first case uh, there is an um, the, the statistical frequency it's defined as the average positive rate over all cover points in the validation data. It does not account for test parameter correlations and there are no structural representations in it. In the second baseline, uh, there are still no structural representations, uh, but it accounts for correlations between test parameters because we are providing uh, one hot identity vectors uh, and, we, and it cannot generalize to unseen cover points. Uh, in the last one, we are providing some CDFG structure, but not the full effect of uh, graph neural network based message passing. And it does account for test parameter uh, correlations. And the way we do this is that each cover point is represented as learned embeddings of corresponding node sequences. So if you remember, I told you that a cover point is a sequence of nodes. Each of those is represented as learned embeddings. So, so in the third case, um, oops, sorry. Uh, in the third case, in this uh, architecture right here, uh, basically the the embeddings here would uh, the embeddings that we generate here is not going to go through a graph neural network, but it's just the the uh, act, the actual node embeddings would just be run through an LSTM or something, and that sequence of embeddings is what we provide. So there is a um, yeah. So that's the that those are the three different baselines that we used. Um, and we find, uh, so we tested it on multiple designs. Some of these are risk designs and uh, risk five designs, and some of these are internal uh, designs, the TPU designs within Google. And uh, what we found was that uh, for the risk architectures, for an unknown test and an unseen cover point, so both are unseen, like not, uh, test is unseen, cover point is unseen. And we find that uh, design to vec this last one, uh, that is our two. That, uh, that's the one that we place, place that bet on. That one generalizes and performs best uh, due to the GNN-based uh, learned representations. The second version, which is also like the node sequence embedding, is not bad uh, because we have, that's the one where we, we use the idea of the control data flow graph. We still use some amount of uh, uh, LSTM. So it's not just pure simulation data based uh, representations, but a little more structural information. And that marks us uh, second best. Uh, the one that the identity, one hot identity vector is, uh, you know, comes in third uh, because, and for good reason, because there's no information about the structure of the design there. There's just uh, identities for each of the cover points. So there's a little bit of learning, but not too much. And the worst one is the one where there is no representation, but it's just all based on um, simulation training data only. So uh, there is another uh, such uh, version of risk um, 
that we used and uh, of risk five that we used and uh, for the for this risk five version we see a similar trend although in this case the margin between design Quebec and the others is much bigger than in the first case so this is the first case uh, for the first design in the second case the margin is much better uh, oh sorry I forgot to mention something about um, how about what this um, is actually showing us sorry uh, so this these tables uh, correspond to accuracy numbers so each of the numbers in the uh, cells there is a, is the accuracy that we got the prediction accuracy for uh, for the question given a test and a cover point the test is never seen the cover point is never seen for this uh, can you predict if this test can cover this cover point and we are, we are measuring the accuracy of that prediction and the columns over here they correspond to how many of the cover points we trained on okay so in the first uh, slide that i showed you first result that i showed you uh, the, the first column is when we trained on 90% of the cover points validated on 10% of the cover points uh, second one is uh, trained on 80% validated on 20 trained on 50 validated on 50 you would think that the 50% number would go down uh, remarkably, but uh, owing to the fact that Design to Vec learns quite a bit about the uh, design, it it, uh, it kind of stays pretty much close to that ballpark. Uh, so in so this is the second version, and in this second version, you can see that the margin between the other methods and Design to Vec is huge because of the uh, representation. Now uh, there is this is a TPU block. Uh, the TPU is a, a Google uh, a chip for it's an ML accelerator chip uh, and a new version comes out uh, every year or so and this is on one of the versions uh, that we basically found that uh, some of the uh, this is on some of the blocks and we found that we are able to with a 91 or 90% accuracy uh, predict whether a given test can cover a given point okay so um, all right, so I'm going to skip this slide because this is about this talks about scaling graph neural network learning. This is a very important aspect of our solution. It's why our solution works for such large designs like uh, uh, for large real designs. Uh, but details of this, uh, I would encourage you to read in the paper because uh, this talks a bit about how for a graph that is so large, we are able to scale graph neural networks. Uh, it's a non-obvious solution, quite interesting. I encourage you to look at it. Now, uh, beyond coverage prediction, oh, there are, so there's, a, uh, I do want to uh, spend a minute here. There is a, uh, the, there, we tried a bunch of different models. So the last one is the one that I, uh, the RTL IPAGN, and that's the one that uh, I was uh, mentioning as, modeled in order to actually uh, to, uh, to uh, mirror the instruction or the control flow of the RTL. The other three are variations of a regular GNN. And what we found was that these are pretty close, uh, but the IPL, IPA GNN does win out every single time. So they, as you can see in the case where there's like a 72 versus a 78 uh, or, uh, you know, 73 versus 75 it does win out although by not a very large margin so in this in these designs uh, it does look like uh, there has been uh, uh, and even in the TPU designs it does look like these are pretty close uh, even if you don't model the control flow it ends up being pretty good anyway the prediction ends up being pretty good uh, so as a second uh, aspect to, uh, to coverage so coverage prediction was one task that we tried to uh, that we we kind of established that design to vec can learn rtl design representations with the coverage prediction task um, because now we are confident that with these numbers that given a test that it has never seen and it is and a cover point that it has never seen this model can tell us if a test can cover that cover point in the design or not so what is the obvious use for something like that? Well, if it so one one obvious use is to use it as is for 
just predicting coverage so a human being can write the test. Oh, can this test cover that point? And now this test is given by a human being. So this acts like a false simulator or a pseudo simulator that can do this, that instead of taking a night of regression to run, uh, can give the ans answer instantaneously, right? So that's an obvious use for it. Another, uh, another uh, more involved use for it is in test generation. So if I know, so the, so the point is, if I know which test can cover which cover point, then if this model knows which test can cover which cover point, then can it generate the test that can cover that point? That's the next question. So then uh, what we did was we used the same model in a generative mode, not in a predictive, but in a generative mode. And uh, while the process and test generation is, it takes forever to do this whole cycle around, have, is my test covering the right thing? And if it doesn't cover everything, oh, can I go, oh, I need to go back and write it. And you keep on doing this over and over again, and it takes forever, okay? So what we did with design to vec was we, we, uh, as I just mentioned, we tried to use this model in a generative mode and say, if you can predict that a test can cover a cover point, can you generate a test that can cover that cover point, right? And that's um, that's basically our uh, next, you know, our latest and uh, greatest uh, value over the NeurIPS paper. Uh, again, I won't go into details in the interest of time here, but. Um, there is a, I'll just talk about this one result. Um, so what we did was we tried to generate tests using the design effect model. These, this uh, uh, slide right here and a couple of other slides here talk about how we did, how we used the same design to vec model in a generative mode as compared to a predictive mode. And then um, we basically did an experiment that I think is interesting. Uh, we can't, we kind of looked at the tests, at uh, generating tests for pretty hard to cover. And the way we uh, found, we kind of uh, defined hard to cover as if you, in a random uh, set of like 1,700 1, samples, if you randomly simulate that uh, design, then you basically, then how, you know, what is the probability of covering that point? So if you see here, the points that are covered very, very rarely uh, in a randomly generated data set, but design to vec is able to actually generate tests for each of these, like it's able to generate 29, 12, 10, 14, et cetera, this many tests for cover points that in a randomly generated data set are extremely hard to cover, okay? And uh, we compared it with some other internal baseline, which uh, in, in almost in all cases, uh, design to vec can do, can, can actually get to these points in far fewer tests. And this was repeated for the TPU. So even for points that are never covered, that cannot be covered with a random data set, we find that design to vec is able to generate, uh, you know, tests within, uh, it's able to generate a test within uh, 17 calls to the simulator or two calls to the simulator and so on. Uh, there's another tool that uh, that we are using as a baseline, and that was able to do it with Bayesian optimization, different version of ML, but it takes very many simulator calls to do it. So um, with that, I think uh, I'm going to uh, wrap up. Uh, these are tests that we did uh, generate through design to vec for uh, uh, using uh, using design to vec for some of the risk five uh, models that we the designs that we tried. Uh, and I think in conclusion, uh, what I would like to say here is that uh, the design to vec is with this technology, we have shown that we can predict reachability of a state in RTL. And uh, since that's the most fundamental computation, we've shown that it is possible to predict with very high accuracy for industrial designs, uh, the, the reachability analysis. And, not, and, and due to that, we can now diversify to other verification tasks like test generation. Uh, and then uh, we can use this technology as a proxy simulator. We can use it for early design analysis, for design understanding, debugging, and so on. 
right? So bug hunting, assertion generation, the list is pretty endless if you think of. So once you're in the realm of deep neural networks and you made something work in a proper, from a representation learning standpoint, then the sky is the limit as we've seen with the natural language and other models, right? So they can always come up with a task for this kind of a foundational model that could now do the new task and the new task with some more amount of fine tuning. And that is what we expect with, will happen uh, with design to X. So uh, thank you very much for listening. And uh, this is the end of my talk. So I'll take questions now. OK, thank you very much, Shoba, for a great talk. Uh, we do have a couple of questions here. Uh, one is from Karen, right? So he's asking, Basically, right, you use this machine learning for hardware uh, RTL verification, right? But meanwhile, there's also machine learning for software verification. Uh, do you think uh, the same methods can be applied to both software and hardware? Or is there any common or difference? Right? Okay, so I assume the question is software testing because uh, the rest of the software, uh, so if, it's the, if the question is software testing, then, um, as a matter of fact, many of these things have been applied for software testing, not exactly this method, uh, because of the, this is a new realm where we needed to model it for totally different um, uh, RTL and you know RTL semantics and so on. So we had to basically, in, and it's a different problem. So we had to invent all these new things for, uh, for it to work. But in the software testing side, I do have a reference for you um, there is a uh, there is a, a couple of neural test generation methods, and these methods have uh, have generally been uh, at least in the on the academic side. There are a few papers that try to do this. My collaborators um, uh, on this paper are also software testing experts, uh, ML for software testing experts, which is uh, which is also uh, you know. Uh, so I have I, I think I know. Uh, which of the papers are, I could even refer you to. So I do have a couple of references, happy to share them uh, you know, after the talk. Yeah, that would be great, right? You can put it in the chat, right? By the way, if you, okay. you can also, you don't have to use full screen, now you can see the chat message box. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, I don't, do you want me to read some questions or you can pick some questions from here? So oh, uh, sure. Um, does this have a possibility of replacing formal verification? No, um, it doesn't. The reason is because formal verification is about the, so if you remember that pyramid, formal verification is at the bottom. So formal verification is complete representation of everything, complete analysis of everything in the system. This is an approximation. So at best, it can only replace human beings doing test generation that that entire loop that i showed you very long and arduous loop that can be probably replaced in the best case that this does very well each time it can actually replace that whole effort but it cannot it uh, since it's an approximation it can never do what formal does it can never provide a guarantee on the entire design it can only look at certain parts of the design and say i know what this does so it's like more like uh, an excellent dynamic uh, uh, analysis engine. Oh, by the way, Shoba, since your talk is the last talk, uh, and if you can stay a little bit longer, uh, that's fine. I think uh, uh, also we appreciate uh, uh, the audience uh, uh, across the globe, right? Some audience even in Japan or something, right? So it's like almost 2 a.m. So- um, Oh, I, I, sorry about that, but uh, no. I'm glad to, I'm happy to stay back. Would you like me to answer more questions, uh, David? Yeah, I think uh, okay. it would be great. Right? We don't, okay. Now we are not constrained, right? In the past, we also, you can type in the chat box, but I guess now speaking is faster. <laughs> so just go ahead okay. right, and answer some other questions that you think. Okay. All right, so I'm going to just... Uh, um... Okay, so the next question is, um, does the ML tool generate the test bench and the tests? Who defines the functional coverage, human or ML model? I'll answer the second question first. Uh, this is code coverage, not functional coverage. Uh, so 
code coverage is automatically generated by the synopsis coverage tools like the branch coverage, assertion coverage, and all those. So the, the cover points are kind of automatically generated. No, the human being is not generating them, but the human being never generates them for code coverage. For functional coverage, it is a um, it's a different deal because uh, as it is functional, this tool is not is currently being used for code coverage, but it can be repurposed for functional coverage. That's uh, if if we looked at assertion cover points as opposed to branch. And then we looked at overall functionality as opposed to specific code construct. I can see this being repurposed for functional coverage, but that's not what the tool does now. Um, the other question is, does it generate the test bench and test? So in the version that I just presented to you, in that version, it just generates the tests. The test bench is, is already there. So we are working off of existing test benches and just generating tests uh, using the tool. In the, I think a, a, a very good vision, a very good vision would be for the tool to come up with the test bench itself. Uh, we are not close to that, I don't think. Uh, it has, it, it needs a significant amount of evidence and many, many milestones between generating tests and then generating the base program itself, the test bench itself. There is a thought that you can do away with the test bench and learn everything you need to learn between the high level test and the design, like functional tests and the design with no test bench in the middle. Uh, but as I said, that's a great vision, but it's some distance away. Okay, uh, next question is the way you showed to change design to work from prediction mode to generative mode, a general way or more specific to your use case? Uh, it is specific to this use case. However, it's not uncommon to have uh, to, to use something in both these uh, modes, to use a deep neural network model in both predictive and then generative uh, modes is, is, a, is, is a common route. OK, so in there, so there are many uh, you can take inspiration from a lot of papers to do this. In the specific case, what we have done is uh, that we have taken design to it, which we know how it predicts and it predicts very well. And we differentiate this model and we are trying to basically generate gradients on this. We are differentiating the model itself in order to generate the new tests. So this is one way to do it. Uh, another way to do it would be that you uh, just use random tests, right? But you use the model to predict each time. So you don't use the model uh, to, uh, as a generator, but you just use it as a predictor. And outside, you have an architecture where you just throw random tests at it. It predicts one way or the other. And then for the ones that it predicts high com with high confidence that it could cover, you output that as your, uh, as your test, right? So there's many ways in which you could do the architecture around this to, to make it a generative model. OK. Uh, are there other one second? So sorry. Uh, yeah, so there's, OK. Um, do you see any difference in predictability for memory intensive designs versus logic intensive? That's a really good question. I don't know. So I can give you an intuition. I haven't tried it. We haven't tried a memory intensive design. Uh, but it seems so at the level of RTL, right, there is a, uh, I would say, this translates your question translates to is control more control intensive or at least I, I will I will make it translate to more control intensive versus more data intensive uh, designs. And it does seem that uh, the control intensive ones are. So let's look at what control intensive means, right? If it is more logic intensive, control intensive, it means that the parts that I showed you in that in the design graph and the design control data flow graph, those paths need to be learned. OK, and there is a limitation in graph neural networks that they since they focus on neighborhood based learning, uh, they are very good at at learning, you know, uh, radially outward from a given node. They're very good at learning the neighborhood. But this whole thing of long paths going from uh, you know, the begin to the end and then uh, arbitrarily long paths, 
they are not known to do very well. This is the reason why we use this IPA GNN and try to see if that would help us more. In our case, I don't know if we got lucky or you know uh, whether the structure of RTL designs is uh, such that it did end up learning even the long parts really well. But I, I am not confident enough to uh, to state that as a generalization that it will always learn long parts well. So I think between the two, it might be that the data intensive designs are potentially uh, easier to learn, uh, but I haven't seen evidence of that so far. Okay, the next question is, did you try an approach where specifications are analyzed by the ML tool, say NLP based, and generate an architecture model? And the ML tool can use the architecture model to create both RTL or gate level design and the test bench plus simulation tests. How is the research happening in this area? So what so what you suggest here is very it's extremely interesting, right? To be able to actually use NLP for looking at an architecture and being able to generate a, an embedding for the architecture. I don't know that uh, there is any technology to do that. I don't know that there is any plan on our side to do that. Uh, but I would be super curious if, uh, if that kind of technology ever takes off. Uh, the, the, the second part of what you say is uh, a little more, uh, I think, closer to home, where we, uh, where we can basically create both the design level, like the RTL embedding and a test bench embedding, and then uh, try to just do away with the whole effort of generating test benches, which is really tedious and takes forever, right? Uh, and that is, again, that's a vision though. That's we are, we are probably many milestones away from that vision, as I said, but that's a great vision to, to pursue. Um, okay. Uh, okay, one more question. Uh, for the model training, we usually have more test cases than designs. That results in the imbalance of CDFGs and test cases. Not sure whether this problem occurs in your task. Do you have any ideas about handling this kind of imbalance? So uh, in our task, we don't need designs. We are doing the generalization within a design. So we just need many tests, okay? We are kind of demonstrating through those tests a small portion of uh, the dynamic activity in the design. We are demonstrating the rest of the design through, you know, graphs and uh, source code. The problem is that given a very small number of tests, uh, can I now navigate the rest of the design, predict whether a given test would reach the rest of the design graph or not, the new test? Because the task is to reach the rest of the design graph. You have to reach everything. You have to have 100% coverage within that design. Now, across designs also, this technology translates, you know, right? Because that's what we showed, right? Across design. But we, are, we don't need to train with different designs in, the, in this version of the tool. What you say would make more, uh, would be more relevant when we start to uh, try, when we try to generalize across designs. So for example, if we are trying to predict with a test for one design or from CDFG of one design, what can happen in the CDFG of an other design, then we would need to train on multiple different design CDFGs. In this task, we don't need that. Okay. Thank you very much, David. Oh, I well, enjoyed uh, it. Thank you so much, Shoba, uh, for a wonderful talk and uh, spend extra time here to answer questions. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, also, thanks everyone uh, who are still staying. Um, so uh, I hope that you, you have uh, learned quite a lot in the last two days. Uh, we had six wonderful talks. And uh, uh, so just a reminder, right? Actually, uh, the next one um, will be in two weeks, uh, November 18 and then 19. So I, I think uh, you have learned quite a bit and you may want to get your hands dirty and uh, you know get the actions, right? So we have actually two uh, industry speakers uh, talking about uh, the AI uh, and the uh, EDA data and the standards and the formats and some some IEEE data efforts here. Right? So uh, please uh, uh, tune in in two weeks 
And uh, thanks all again uh, to today's speaker session, uh, Song Q and Shoba for great talks. So I uh, hope everyone have a great weekend. And uh, uh, thanks uh, to all the organizers. Thanks, Andrew, and uh, uh, you know, the, the student organizers and uh, logistics support. Right? OK, uh, Andrew, I don't know if you have anything to add. Or... No, uh, uh -huh. we will prune the recordings and post them on the Telos AI Institute's YouTube channel. And likely also IEEE CAS Society will, will post these seasonal schools as well. So yes. Thanks so much to everyone. Okay. Have a good weekend. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Have a great weekend.